All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Committee on Land Use. I am Councilmember Rafael Salamanca, the Chair of this Committee. I would like to welcome my esteemed colleagues who are members of the Committee and are here with us today. We have Council Members Gibson, Constantinides, Deutsch, Kuhl, Richards, Grudenchik, Adams, Diaz, Chair Moya, and Rivera. I want to thank Chair Moya and Chair Adams for their work on our land use subcommittees. Today we'll be voting on a number of projects referred out of our zoning subcommittee, and we will also be holding a hearing jointly with our subcommittee on zoning and franchise on the topic of city environmental quality review procedures. If you are here to testify our, at our joint hearing, please fill out a speaker slip with the Sergeant of Arms, and we will start now with our votes. Today we'll vote to approve ZOUs 391 and 392 for the 1050 Pacific Street rezoning in Majority Leader Cumbles District in Brooklyn. The proposed actions will rezone an existing M1-1 district to an M1-4 slash R7A special mixed use district and map the project area as a mandatory inclusionary housing area with options one and two. We will also vote to approve LUs 393 and 394, the 1010 Pacific Street rezoning, also a majority leader Cumbles District in Brooklyn. The application sought to rezone an existing M1-1 district to an R7D slash C2-4 district and map the project area as a mandatory inclusionary housing area with MIH option one and two. The City Planning Commission modified the application to rezone the area to an R7A slash C2-4 and we will be approving this decision of the commission. We will vote to approve pre considers LU 386 through 389, the 1921 Atlantic Avenue rezoning in Councilmember Ampre Samuels District in Brooklyn. The application seeks to rezone the project area from an M1 1 R7D district to an R8A slash C2 4 district. A zoning text amendment to map the site as a mandatory inclusionary housing area using option one, UDAP area and project designation, disposition approval, and an amendment to the Saratoga Square Urban Renewal Plan. These actions will facilitate the development of a new 14-story mixed-use building with approximately 235 affordable apartments, retail and community facility, open space, and 44 below-grade accessory parking spaces. We will also vote to approve with modifications LUs 390, this application in regarding the 270 Park Avenue in Manhattan. Zoning text amendment relating to East Mid Midtown Subdistrict of the Special Midtown District would be amended to facilitate a 10,000 square foot open publicly accessible space on the development sites Madison Avenue frontage instead of within the through lot portion as well as other changes necessary to make this alternative location for the open space viable. Our modification will make clear that this amendment We'll make clear this amendment, amended zoning text only applies to the project site, which was the intent of the proposal. Are there any questions or remarks from members of the committee? All right, seeing none, I will now call on a vote in accordance with recommendations of the local council members and of the subcommittees to approve LUs 391, 392, 393, 394, and preconsiders LUs 386 through 389, and to approve with the modifications I have described LU 390. Will the clerk please call the roll? William Martin, committee clerk, will call vote committee on land use. All items are coupled. Chair Salamanca. Aye, no. Gibson. Constantinidis. Aye, no. Deutsch. Aye. Ku. Aye. Richards. Aye. Gorenchik. I and all, I'm going to embarrass the newly appointed uh, Buildings Commissioner for the City of New York and welcome Ms. LaRocca here this morning. We're so excited that you're in that new position. I and all. Adams. Aye. Diaz. Aye. Moya. Aye. Rivera. I and all. By vote of 11 in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions, all items have been adopted by the committee. Thank you. I will uh, leave the roll open. Uh, we will take a two-minute recess, and we will start with our, uh, our oversight hearing.
Continuation roll call, Committee on Land Use, Council Member Barron. Uh, thank you. I vote aye on land use 390, and I vote no on the others. No on land use 386 through, eight, through 389, 391, and 392, 393, and 394. Thank you. Miller. I vote aye. Current vote items, uh, Committee on Land Use. Land Use item 390 is adopted by the committee. There are 13 in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions with uh, preconsidered land use items 386 to 389, 391, 392, 393, and 394 adopted by the committee. 12 in the affirmative, one in the negative, and no abstentions. All right, thank you very much. For the remainder of today's meeting, the Committee on Land Use, jointly with, the, with, its, with its subcommittee on zoning and franchise, will hold an oversight hearing titled Oversight. Are city environmental quality review procedures useful for accurately predicting and mitigating impacts of city planning commission decisions? This hearing will consider issues related to identifying, assessing, and mitigating significant environmental impacts in connection with city planning commission decisions with a focus on larger actions such as called neighborhood rezonings. In addition to this oversight topic, the committees will consider four related bills and a resolution which address the identification and mitigation of significant impacts of land use actions related to residential and commercial displacement, school capacity, and overcrowding in transportation. Introduction number 252 by Councilman Reynoso. Intro number 1487 and 1531 by Councilmember Moya. Introduction number 1523 by Councilmember Joni. And resolution number nine by Councilmember Barron. Representatives of the Mayor's Office of Environmental Coordination, the City Planning Commission, the Department of City Planning, the Department of Education, the School Construction Authority, the Department of Transportation, and the Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development, the Municipal Arts Society, and the Pratt Center, and other experts, advocates, and stakeholders have been invited to testify. Environmental review has an important procedural and some city's role in how the city makes its land use decisions. All land use applications that are subject to the Uniform Land Use Review Procedure and all applications for changes to the zoning resolution must be analyzed in accordance with city environmental quality review procedures. If a determination is made that a proposed action is likely to have significant impacts on the environment, the City Planning Commission must prepare or cause to be prepared an environmental impact statement, commonly referred to as EIS. The State Environmental Quality Review Act further requires that when a local agency decides to approve an action which has been the subject of an EIS, such agency shall make an explicit finding that to the maximum extent practicable. Adverse environmental effect, efforts reveal that the EIS process will be minimized or avoided. As, as a consequence, an EIS that fails to accurately project adverse environmental impacts may not trigger mitigation measures to address likely impacts. To assist city agencies in fulfilling their environmental review responsibility, the Mayor's Office of Environmental Coordination Procedure and the Seeker Technical Manual. The Seeker Technical Manual provides technical guidance and methodologies for conducting the environmental review in 19 areas of required analysis. The methodologies of the Seeker Technical Manual have been the subject of significant criticism and debate for their failure to account for develop development and mitigation in rather pronounced ways in connection with a number of neighborhood rezonings, including downtown Brooklyn and Long Island City. The Municipal Art Society and the Pratt Center for Community Development, notably, have both produced papers on this subject and will present testimony on their analysis and conclusions today. During this hearing, members will have the opportunity to ask the administration and these experts questions about a range of their concerns relating to the SECA process. However, the testimony today, my questions, and I hope the majority of my colleagues' questions will focus on the SECA process as it relates to neighborhood rezonings, particularly in the development of the reasonable worst case development scenario analysis, the identification of mitigation for adverse impacts, the fulfillment of mitigation commitments, and the analysis methods for determining whether there will be socioeconomic impacts, school overcrowding, or transportation impacts. We have a lot of witnesses today and a lot of questions. Before, but before we begin, I would like to give the sponsors of the legislation we are hearing today an opportunity to offer some remarks, starting with my co-chair, chair of the Zoning and Franchise Subcommittee, Council Chair Moya. 
Thank, thank you so much. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Chair Salamanca. Uh, it is my pleasure to be able to uh, co-chair this hearing uh, with you on the city's environmental quality review process uh, for neighborhood rezonings and the methodology set forth in the secret technical manual. Uh, I also want to thank you for this opportunity to hear the two bills I have before this uh, committee today. Uh, I have been very vocal about my concerns that neighborhood rezonings for the last several years have promoted the construction of luxury housing and displaced low-income residents and small businesses. Uh, I have raised concerns that mapping mandatory inclusionary housing area on such a rezoning is not sufficient uh, mitigation for the displacement that such rezonings actually cause. Uh, the Seeker Technical Manual defines uh, secondary displacement, also known as indirect displacement, as the involuntary displacement of residents, businesses, or employees that result from a change in socioeconomic conditions created by a change in land use. According to the Seeker Technical Manual, a socioeconomic assessment should be conducted if a project may be reasonably expected to create socioeconomic changes, uh, such as rising rents within the area affected by the project that would not be expected to occur without the project. The stated purpose of the indirect residential displacement analysis is to determine whether the proposed project may introduce a trend or accelerate a trend of changing socioeconomic conditions that may potentially displace a population of renters living in units not protected by rent stabilization, rent control, or other government regulations restricting rents. If the assessment identifies a population which is vulnerable to displaced, displacement based upon income and other factors, and the group exceed 5% of the study area population, the secret technical manual indicates that a significant adverse impact may occur. It then directs that mitigation be measured, uh, be, measured be considered. Uh, no recent EIS produced in connection with a neighborhood rezoning has found a potential for significant adverse impact with respect to indirect residential displacement. The Pratt Center argues that there are four reasons that the approach taken by the secret technical manual is insignificant, uh, insufficient excuse me, for determining secondary displacement. First, the lack of any analysis of racial or ethnic demographic impacts. Second, the exclusion of buildings larger than six units containing rent regulated units from consideration as soft sites. And third, the provision that a proposed action must introduce a trend or accelerate a trend of changing socioeconomic conditions in order for it to have an impact. And lastly, the wide discretion of uh, the wide discretion an applicant has to determine that no significant impacts are anticipated because of mitigating factors, particularly as a result of the creation of a mandatory exclusionary housing area. Similar points were raised in a 2018 report titled Inclusive City, Strategies to Achieve a More Equitable and Predictable Land Use in New York City, produced by the Regional Planning Association in collaboration with with a land use uh, reform working group that included representatives from the office of the Manhattan Borough President, various advocacy organizations, including Pratt and the Municipal Arts Society, and the staff of several city council members. Because the city doesn't look back at the effects of its rezonings, we have no data on whether the CPC's projections or indirect displacement impacts are accurate or whether, as suggested by the secret technical manual, the existence of the MIH program is effective in mitigating displacement. To address, to address this problem, I have introduced uh, intro number 1487, a local law to amend the New York City Charter in relation to studying the uh, incidence of secondary displacement resulting from neighborhood rezonings. This bill would require HPD to conduct a study of indirect displacement resulting from a neighborhood rezoning approved by the CPC on or after January 1, 2015. The study would be required to cover a period from the approval of the action to a five year after such date. If the study reveals a significant disparity between the actual secondary displacement and that, and that projected in the EIS, HBD would be required to make recommendations for changing the methodology of the secret technical manual to better project such displacement in the future. This would give the council and the CPC the opportunity to review major land use action and work collect, uh, collaboratively to improve the environmental review process. 
To address similar problems that relate to education, I've also introduced intro number 1531, a local law to amend the New York City Charter in relation to studying and reporting on the education capacity and overcrowding impacts of decision of the City Planning Commission in connection with certain land use actions. This bill would require a similar retrospective review of the school capacity and utilization rates four and 10 years after neighborhood rezonings. We are familiar with the enormous uh, unanticipated residential developments that resulted from rezonings in downtown Brooklyn and Long Island City and how that development has strained the capacity of schools in those neighborhoods. However, we've had no accounting for what in the seeker process failed to identify these impacts and thus failed to provide for mitigation. This bill would require that where there is a significant discrepancy between the projects uh, in the FEIS for a neighborhood rezoning and the actual impacts, the lead agency would be required to make recommendations for changing the seeker methodologies for forecasting impacts and mandating mitigation. I look forward to hearing testimony on these and the other pieces of legislation we will hear today and the critiques of seeker that the Municipal Arts Society and the Pratt Institute will present. And I want to thank my colleagues and the incredible land use staff for their participation. And I return the floor uh, to Chair Salamanca. Thank you, uh, Chair Moya. Next, I would like to recognize uh, Council Member Reynoso. Uh, but before I allow you to uh, give your statement, I, I think we have to vote. And so if you can let Council Member Reynoso vote, please. Continuation roll call, Community on Land Use, Council Member Reynoso. I vote on all. Thank you, Council Member. Um, next, I would like to recognize Council Member Reynoso, who is a sponsor of Intro uh, 252, a local law to amend the New York City Charter in relation to tracking mitigation strategies in final environmental impact statements as part of the ULER. Council Member Reynoso. Uh, first, I want to thank the chairs uh, for having this important hearing uh, on a topic that has long been under discussion in communities across the city, and I also want to thank uh, you for being here as well. Um, my neighborhood of Williamsburg has become infamous for the spectacular failures of the 2005 Williamsburg Greenpoint Waterfront rezoning. What happened in 2005 was a planning failure for numerous reasons, but one of the most compelling shortcomings was the failure of the prepared environmental review statement which vastly underestimated the development that occurred and the resulting impacts. By now, many of you have heard me talk about how this rezoning re resulted in the displacement of thousands of Latinos from the neighborhood that I grew up in. The impacts went well beyond an increase in housing costs. The rezoning converted working manufacturing districts to residential use, which subsequently displaced thriving industrial businesses that my neighborhood depended on for middle-class jobs. The EIS, said about direct business displacement, quote, current real estate data and property listings suggest that businesses displaced by the proposed action would have an ample opportunity to relocate in Brooklyn and some within Greenpoint or Williamsburg, end quote. This is a nice academic argument, but we know that's not how it played out in reality. As soon as surrounding property owners saw the profits that, they could, that could be made by converting to residential, we saw an explosion in speculation, uh, BSA variances, and illegal conversions. Those firms had nowhere to go, and the people they employed lost their jobs, leaving them unable to afford the rapidly rising costs of living in the area. Additionally, our transportation system was completely overwhelmed, as anyone who's ever waited for the L at Bedford Avenue can attest. Williamsburg was not unique though. We've seen similar rezonings in LIC and downtown Brooklyn, where the EIS did a terrible job at predicting the type of development and how much of it was going to occur and subsequently vastly underestimated the impacts of the surrounding area. Now I recognize that the EIS is ultimately an educated guess, not an exact science. However, the city does very little to address the inherent shortcomings of the EIS process. For starters, to my knowledge, the city has never gone back to, build, to, to the build year to assess how effective the met methodology was in predicting outcomes. Additionally, the zoning used by DCP is often so flexible that a rezoning can result in vastly different outcomes than intended. The downtown Brooklyn rezoning is a perfect example of this. If DCP's intent was to catalyze office development why did they allow developers to choose between residential and commercial development? In Williamsburg, DCP mapped MX districts that allow for both manufacturing and residential uses. Residential won out every single time. 
Finally, there is no mechanism to secure mitigations for unanticipated adverse impacts, leaving communities left with no recourse when the EIS ends up being incorrect. And for those mitigations that are proposed in the EIS, there is no obligation to implement them. So I am pleased that we'll be having a hearing on my bill today that will create a tracker for all mitigation measures proposed in an EIS. This will ensure that the public is aware of what mitigations were proposed and will, and will secure a level of accountability in implementing these mitigations. Finally, we are a growing city and we need development to accommodate this growth. However, that growth cannot come at the expense of existing neighborhoods. All New Yorkers have a right to a livable, uh, livable neighborhood, and we have an obligation to couple growth with protections for existing residents and infrastructure investments. The EIS process is currently failing far short of this, falling far short of this. We cannot continue to develop without addressing these issues immediately. Thank you for allowing me to, test, uh, for allowing me to submit this testimony. Thank you, uh, Councilman Merenoso. I would like to recognize that we've been joined by Councilmember Torres, and we're going to give you an opportunity to vote. Continuation roll call vote. We on land use, Councilmember Torres. I vote aye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Councilmember Reynoso. Next, I recognize Councilmember Barron, who's a sponsor of Resolution 9, calling on the Mayor and the Mayor's Office of Environmental Coordination and the City Planning Commission, the Department of City Planning, and all other relevant city agencies to re-examine the standards in the SECA regulations and the technical manual for assessing when a possible adverse impact on a neighborhood's character or socioeconomic status requires a detailed analysis and possible mitigation. It also calls on the relevant agencies when such significant adverse impacts are identified to seek mitigation or development alternatives that provide long-term or permanent protection for the residents, businesses, and the character of the affected community, including through the provision of permanently affordable housing and commercial space. Council Member Barron. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I want to thank, uh, thank you for holding this hearing, very important and for including my reso with the other intros that have been cited uh, already. When the federal government started advancing increased housing by transit hubs, they specifically stated in their document that this will result in disenfranchisement of housing rights for people who already live there, it would lead to gentrification, and those are its words in its report. What we have seen happening here, I think, is a continuation of what my colleague had cited going back to 2005, and unfortunately continued by this council in 2014 with the East New York rezoning plan. It was that plan that at the outset said that 50% of the housing in the East New York rezoning area would be at market rate. That was stated at the outset. And as it turns out, about 12% of the remaining housing actually falls within the income ranges of the persons who presently live in East New York. It also talked about the density, the explosion of the population in general that results with these um, rezonings. I, I'm in a competition with the chair to see who can get the highest numbers of housing brought to their district that does not displace the people who presently live there and that includes an opportunity for housing for the formerly homeless. In that area, he's got me a little bit beat. But generally, we're neck and neck in that regard. What we're seeing happening is that the rezonings that are taking place are moving what had been 20% affordable, 80% market to now 25% affordable and 75% market. For me, that is unacceptable because it does not address the housing need that we see here in New York City. So my resolution talks about re-examining the ways in which the assessments are made, uh, determining what the impact is on communities, and in fact, when those disparate uh, factors are found and identified, that we seek mitigation or development of long-term or permanent protections for residents 
as well as for businesses to be able to protect the character of the community. And the remedies that we're looking for may include permanent affordability and affordability for commercial space for those businesses that presently are in that area. So I just wanted to summarize that I'm looking forward to hearing from the panel, and I would like to know particularly what your response is to Reso 9, which is the one that I have introduced. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Barron. We will also be hearing intro number 1523 by Councilmember Joni, a local law to amend the New York City Charter in relation to studying and reporting on transportation impacts of decisions of the City Planning Commission in connection with certain land use actions. Councilmember Jonai has a deaf in the family and is not able to join us today. I now call on the first panel. We have, and if I uh, do not pronounce your name right, please correct me, uh, Susan Amron, the General Counsel for City Planning, Olga Abinader, Albina, am I saying that right? No, all right. <laughs> Esther Bruner, and Hilary Semel. And so we're gonna ask the council to please swear you in. Please raise your right hands. Do you swear to affirm, to tell the truth, the whole truth in, in, in your uh, testimony before these committees and in response to all council member questions? And so uh, you could begin with your statement. Um, thank you and, and good morning, Chair Salamanca, Chair Moya, and members of the committee. Um, my name is Susan Amron. I am the general counsel at the Department of City Planning. I'm joined here by Olga Abinader. She's the Acting Director of Environmental Assessment and Review Division at the Department of City Planning. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the City Environmental Re uh, Quality Review Procedures and on Introductions Number 252, 1487, 1523, and 1531. We appreciate the City Council's concern for adequate planning and take the issues raised, including residential displacement, very seriously. At the Department of City Planning, the city's primary land use agency, we are responsible for planning for the orderly growth and development of the city of New York. We administer the city's land use review process, known as ULERP, conduct planning studies, and collect statistical and other data that serve as the basis for land use planning recommendations. Department of City Planning staff also aid the City Planning Commission in all matters under its jurisdiction. The City Planning Commission holds regular public hearings and votes on applications concerning the use, development, and improvement of real property subject to city regulation. The City, Planning's the city Planning Commission's consideration includes environmental review, an assessment of the potential environmental impacts of land use actions where required by law. These environmental reviews are conducted in accordance with the State Environmental Quality Review Act, known as CEQRA, and the City Environmental Quality Review Procedures, known as CEQR. The City's environmental review process is among the most comprehensive and thorough in the nation. It's important to remember that environmental review is a disclosure process that applies only to discretionary decision making and not to the as-of-right development that constitute approximately 80% of the projects in the city. It is intended to provide the best information available to decision makers about the potential significant adverse environmental impacts of an action. For example, when DCP or a private applicant proposes a zoning map amendment, DCP analyzes and discloses in a full environmental impact statement or a shorter environmental assessment statement the potential significant adverse environmental impacts of that zoning map amendment. My colleagues at the Mayor's Office of Environmental Coordination will discuss the process in more depth. The City Planning Commission considers those potential environmental impacts when it votes on the proposal. But the results of the environmental review process represent only one of many pieces of information considered by the City Planning Commission, or in fact, any other decision maker. Other considerations for the City Planning Commission include the purpose and need for an action, the appropriateness of use bulk and density considering surrounding land uses, and the availability of transit. Because environmental reviews assess potential impacts of actions that don't occur until years later or over a period of years, they are necessarily based on assumptions about the future. 
These assumptions could project conditions only a few years into the future, such as for an application where a single building is proposed, or a decade or more into the future, such as for an application affecting a larger geography, like an area-wide rezoning. Although projections are based on the best information that's available at the time, projections made for environmental reviews, like all projections, are imperfect. There is a limit on the kind of data and indicators that are available to measure many of these issues. And even if we had perfect data, which does not always exist, it could not eliminate uncertainty about what will happen in the future. And the further into the future we seek to predict, the less precise we will be. For example, past traffic analyses could not have predicted the rise of four higher vehicles such as Uber or Lyft. Current traffic analyses are likely not to accurately predict the impact that congestion pricing or self-driving vehicles will have. Past displacement analyses could not have predicted changes in federal immigration policy, global economic trends and the 2008 economic recession, Superstorm Sandy, and other influencing factors. Environmental review cannot and should not be expected to predict the future with the degree of precision that is suggested by these bills. Environmental review is also not a tool that looks backwards to identify causes of current conditions. Indeed, it is doubtful that one could trace current conditions to specific causes, including rezoning. In fact, displacement resulting from rising rents is a challenge citywide both in areas that have been rezoned and in areas that are not being rezoned. And there are myriad reasons why households move and medium incomes and in neighborhoods rise. To focus solely on rezoning as the driver of neighborhood change misses the complexity, the complex reality of New York City's population dynamics and treats neighborhoods as static places. While we take these issues very seriously, addressing them in the context of environmental review is not helpful as environmental review is not a panacea to address systemic issues. Again, it's a disclosure tool prepared at a specific moment in time intended to aid decision makers. I would like to note that through the environmental review process, the Department of City Planning works closely with its sister agencies, particularly those with technical expertise. When DCP undertakes an environmental review, it seeks other agencies' expertise on specific technical areas typically considered in environmental review, including, for example, hazardous materials, open space, historic and cultural resources, transportation, and community facilities such as schools, among other topics. Expert agencies provide guidance related to methodologies used for environmental review analyses, identification of significant adverse impacts, and appropriate mitigation members. However, these agencies do not rely on environmental review analyses and development projections to perform their programmatic functions. This includes the School Construction Authority with respect to the need for public schools, the Department of Transportation with respect to transportation infrastructure, and the Department of Housing Preservation and Development with respect to measures to protect tenants and implement affordable housing strategies. Environmental review represents at most one of many pieces of information agencies consider before decisions are made with regard to building new schools, investing in transportation improvements, and implementing affordable housing programs. In summary, the Department of City Planning agrees that a robust re reasoned analysis of environmental impacts of land use actions are critical to good decision making. At the same time, we recognize the role that environmental review was designed to play and believe that the environmental review process is not an appropriate means to address broader traffic, school capacity, and displacement concerns raised in these bills. We support better tracking of mitigation commitments, which our colleagues at the Mayor's Office of Environmental Coordination will speak to. Again, thank you for the opportunity to testify today and we look forward to a continued dialogue with the Council on these issues. Um, good morning. Thank you, Chair Salamanca, Chair Moya, and members of the committee for this opportunity to testify on the City Environmental Quality Review Procedures and the proposed intros 252, 1487, 1523, and 1535. I am Hilary Semmel, the Director and General Counsel of the Mayor's Office of Environmental Coordination, or OEC. 
I am joined by Esther Bruner, who is the Deputy Director of Regulatory Programs at OEC. Um, before I address the legislation, I'd like to provide some background on the, around, about the role of OEC, as many members of the public may be unfamiliar with us, as well as the development and use of the Seeker Technical Manual. And I probably will refer to it as the Tech Manual because that's the state of the art term, but it's formally known as the Seeker Technical Manual. OEC is an independent office within the office of the mayor established in 1991 under Mayor Dinkins to be the, the city's central seeker office with procedural, legal, and policy expertise on all aspects of environmental review. Our mission is to ensure the integrity of the environmental review process by providing information and assistance to agencies and applicants. Transparency is also a main priority of our work. We coordinate environmental reviews across the technical agencies, assist city agencies that may not have the expertise and capacity to undertake environmental review on their own, maintain the public repository for all environmental reviews conducted in the city, and coordinate periodic updates to the guidance found in the Seeker Tech Manual. OEC is also charged with developing and maintaining a technical database for applicants and city agencies to complete environmental review documents and with tracking mitigation measures. My office is currently pursuing two major initiatives as part of the Seeker workflow, the Seeker Technical Manual Update and the Seeker Database Update. Now I'll go on to talk about the Tech Manual. Um, as mentioned by Susan, environmental reviews are disclosure documents. They exist to inform decision makers what the potential environmental impacts of a city action might be based on available information at a point in time and what measures are available to mitigate significant environmental adverse impacts identified in the review to the maximum extent practical. Seeker is New York City's environmental review process pursuant to the New York State Environmental Quality Review Act, CEQRA, so Seeker and CEQRA. CEQRA is triggered when a state or local government agency takes a discretionary action such as funding a project, approving a rezoning, or disposing of government-owned property. Since CEQRA only applies to discretionary actions, the majority of development projects undertaken in the city are not subject to environmental review because they are done as of right. The purpose of environmental review is to inform decision makers by disclosing the potential for significant adverse environmental impacts and the required mitigation measures prior to discretionary actions being taken. If the initial review of a project, which is documented in the city by an environmental assessment statement, or EAS, determines at a threshold level that a project has the potential for significant adverse environmental impacts, the lead agency will undertake a more in-depth analysis of the action or project, which is documented in an environmental impact statement, or an EIS. During the EIS process, the lead agency or applicant collaborates with other technical agencies to scope and review the environmental impact analysis and where significant adverse impacts are identified to identify potential mitigation measures. Public comments are solicited and responded to with regard to scoping and on the analysis and mitigation measures described in the draft EIS. The final EIS describes in detail the completed analysis in each technical area and, in addition to including the above mentioned response to comments, also describes mitigation measures for the project. The lead agency then makes findings based on the conclusions in the final EIS by which the agency commits to the identified mitigation measures. When a city action triggers the need for environmental review under CEQRA, the lead agency will utilize the CEQRA tech manual guidance and methodologies to conduct the appropriate analyses. The manual includes 19 technical areas, such as air quality, noise, transportation, and socioeconomic conditions, and, re and recommends analysis methodologies for each area. The purpose of the manual is to ensure a rigorous standard of review while maintaining uniformity and transparency for applicants, city agency reviewers, and public stakeholders. Lead agencies and applicants utilize the methodologies and guidance provided in the manual to assist in identifying potential adverse environmental impacts of proposed actions, assessing their significance, and proposing feasible, practical, practicable measure, measures to eliminate or mitigate significant impacts, 
In other words, make informed decisions with regard to the potential environmental impacts of the proposed action and potential mitigation measures based on the information that is available at the time such action is proposed. The Seeker Tech Manual methodologies are developed by city agencies with the respective subject matter expertise in collaboration with OEC. The Seeker Technical Manual, while a living document like all technical guidance, has been cited as one of the most rigorous environmental analysis guidance documents that allows for one of the most comprehensive environmental impact review processes in the nation. Seeker, uh, the key entities in the environmental review process that use the Seeker Tech Manual are the lead agency and the applicant. The lead agency is the city entity that is principally responsible for undertaking, funding, or approving a proposed action or project. The applicant is the entity that is seeking city discretionary approvals, such as funding or CPC approvals, to facilitate their proposed project. The applicant be, can be either a private or city entity. For any environmental review conducted under Seeker, OEC recommends that the analysis methodologies in the Seeker Technical Manual be followed. As mentioned before, OEC is the keeper of the Seeker Tech Manual. In line with OEC's mission, we maintain and periodically update the Seeker Technical Manual to ensure the integrity of environmental review for the proposed city actions. The methodologies in the Tech Manual are the most rigorous in the nation and help ensure that decisions by the city are made in a transparent, well-informed manner. The first Seeker Tech Manual was published in 1993, and it was updated in 2001, 2010, 2012, and 2014. The initial publication of the manual and subsequent updates occurred under OEC leadership. During the update process, OEC and its partner agencies align Seeker methodologies with applicable policies and standards and take into account relevant changes in the city. The recent updates were all structured to enable the most comprehensive and informed environmental analysis where city discretionary actions are required. City agencies with expert jurisdiction over certain technical areas led the updating in the, to those methodologies. Some agencies are in charge of one analysis area, while others cover multiple analysis areas. For example, the Department of Sanitation is responsible for the solid waste analysis, while the Department of Environmental Protection is responsible for natural resources, water and sewer infrastructure, hazardous materials, air quality, and noise analyses. The updates range from simple text revisions to making the manual more accessible to changes in how certain analysis steps are to be conducted. In parallel, these updates all included targeted stakeholder engagement to collect input on the manual from professionals who work in the urban planning and land use fields. OEC provided the public input, input to the respective technical agencies for consideration. City agencies provided regular progress reports to OEC. The relevant agencies worked collaboratively throughout the update to ensure that the methodologies continue to be state of the art and to reflect the environmental concerns that are unique to New York City. As mentioned, the most recent update to the manual was in 2014, and I am excited to share that we will soon be launching a manual update. While we, while we are still working out the details regarding the timing, scope, and format of the update, we look forward to engaging with the Council throughout the process. With respect to the proposed legislation, and regards to specifically Intro 252, OEC is generally in support of the intent of this bill with respect to bringing more transparency to mitigation tracking. However, we think the bill as proposed is not the best approach to accomplish the intent and suggest that the responsibility for mitigation tracking remain with OEC for several reasons. First, because tracking mitigation is very complicated due to a variety of factors such as different agencies in charge of mitigation measures, complex contractual obligations, the need for additional monitoring and post-seeker analyses required to confirm that the agreed upon measures are feasible, particularly in the case of long-term projects such as rezonings, we believe that the best suited entity to undertake this effort is OEC. As discussed before, OEC is already tasked with overall environmental review coordination in the city, including mitigation, and is currently actively working on initiatives that will incorporate aspects of mitigation tracking. OEC will be, happy, will be able to apply its unique seeker expertise to the development of process and the development of a public mitigation tracker. 
Second, our office is already tasked to develop and implement a tracking system to ensure that mitigation measures are implemented in a timely manner, and we believe delegating this responsibility to the Mayor's Office of Operations, which manages the NYC rezoning tracker, is not appropriate. The rezoning tracker tracks administration commitments made to council and communities during EULER that may be outside the scope of the project and therefore environmental review. Thus, tracking mitigation measures identified in environmental review is something entirely different. The two should not be mixed up in the same tracker. We would, we would like to note that developing a mitigation tracking system will require substantial additional resources, not just in our office, but potentially also at certain agencies. With regard to intros 1487, 1523, 1523, and 1531, like the Department of City Planning, OEC believes the intent to this legislation is to ensure that the city is doing all it can to promote transparency in the seeker process. But we do not believe seeker is the appropriate tool to address the universal concerns that these bills are raising. We reiterate, we reiterate that environmental review, by nature, simplifies reality at a couple of moments in time in order to inform the decision makers about a proposed project's potential significant adverse impacts in specific technical areas and to develop measures that may mitigate those impacts or, if such measures are not practicable, to inform them that proceeding with a project would lead to unmitigated impacts. In conclusion, I would like to thank this committee for recognizing the importance of SEEKER and transparent mitigation implementation and track tracking. I thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have at this time. Um, my colleagues at DOT, HPD, and SEA are submitting testimony and are available for questions and answers. Okay, thank you very much for your, uh, for your testimony. Um, I want to start with a few questions on the, um, the reasonable worst case development scenario framework, uh, if possible. Does the city study areas after they are rezoned to determine how accurate the reasonable worst case development scenario was at predicting development compared to the actual development that happened after the rezoning? Thank you, council member. That is a great question. Um, the, with regard to the reasonable worst case development scenario, it's it encompasses many different things. Uh, the projected um, additional incremental units of housing in the case of a rezoning. Um, my colleagues at other agencies do go, and also, for example, the impacts on uh, school seats. My colleagues at other agencies do go back at moments in time to look at what is happening on the ground, like doing other types of analyses, but through Seeker, we don't go back and look at the reasonable worst case development scenario per se, whether it came to fruition. DCP might want to. So how do you determine if your predictions were correct if you don't go back and check? Well, we rely on the lead agency to, first of all, look at whether mitigation measures are being implemented and coordinating with other agencies to do assessments after the development, periodically after the development scenarios should be taking place. For example, DOT goes back and looks to, to see whether the mitigation measures are warranted for transportation mitigation measures that are identified at the time so that if they are not required or they need to be changed, they are adjusted for what the, the reality is at the time. But we don't track necessarily whether the reasonable worst case development scenario took place as described in the original seeker document for the reasons that DCP articulated is that seeker is a forward looking document. We cannot, especially with area wide rezonings that take place over 5, 10, 15 years, we cannot identify certain trends that may impact how the, the reasonable worst case development scenario is played out. We try to take the most conservative approach and overestimate the, uh, the potential for effects, the most conservative effects that would happen and then hope that the, the or, and we believe that by taking a conservative approach, we will be able to identify the, the 
the most conservative potential for adverse environmental impacts. So is there any quality review process on your reporting? I mean, it just doesn't make sense. You're, 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 you're coming up with a decision on what's the reasonable worst case scenario, and you, you're telling me that you don't go back to check to see how accurate that worst case scenario is. And so how can we actually trust your decision making on the worst case scenario if you're not well, going I, back and checking to see how accurate it was? I would say the, at the in initiation of the environmental review process, one of the quality controls is that the reasonable, this is, the seeker system works like a peer review, so when an applicant proposes a reasonable worst case development scenario, the um, project description in the draft scope of work and the EIS uh, is vetted through all the city technical agencies using their uh, their information about strategic planning into, in the city to see what they, uh, if they agree with the reasonable worst case development scenario, and we use a consensus, a consensus approach uh, throughout the city agency family to agreement on the reasonable worst case development scenario. So at the threshold of environmental review, there is a quality control process to make sure that all the agencies that are responsible for implementing mitigation measures agree with the proposed reasonable worst case development scenario. How does the city planning analyze and understand the discrepancies between what was predicted and what actually happened? Um, I will refer to my colleague at DCP to answer this question. Um, city planning, when it makes predictions about uh, what the uh, uh, rezoning or what an action will bring in the future, is necessarily making projections about what will happen in the future. Um, we don't then go back and try and figure out um, whether it precisely what we had projected actually comes to be in 10 years or 15 years or five years. Um, in fact, there, um, uh, there are uh, always unforeseen circumstances, unforeseen influences that um, can affect the uh, projections as to the future. But what we do, um, and we and our, and our sister agencies do, is when, uh, after a rezoning, and, and in fact, in all communities of the city, um, we uh, are aware of what is going on and uh, evaluate things like school need and transportation, not based on the projections that were made at, at, in a certain neighborhood at a certain time, but in terms also of what's going on uh, at the current time and what's projected into the future. And so it's really, in terms of the programs, it's, it's, it, we don't rely on the environmental review projections into the future. We that is only one, one piece of information that uh, determines city programs. How accurate was the reasonable worst case development scenario in downtown Brooklyn when it was rezoned? It's my understanding that it was uh, supposed to be office based, now it's high rise residential. You're, you're, that, that's a good, a, a good point and thank you for that question. The, we view the downtown Brooklyn rezoning as a very successful rezoning. Um, the downtown Brooklyn um, is a vital, uh, alive uh, community. But the en environmental review at the time did predict that there was going to be uh, more office space and less pre residential demand than turned out to exist in downtown Brooklyn. The rezoning responded to demand and the economy and market conditions. In fact, now we are seeing uh, increased demand for office space as a result of uh, changing economy and changing needs. Um, so it was not precisely as we predicted, um, but we do view that um, rezoning as a very successful rezoning. So what did you do to mitigate? The, uh, and I will ask some of my colleagues to, uh, to jump in um, if you want the details on that, but the decisions now about um, are more schools needed? What's going on in the transportation network? Um, uh, an, a, a variety, the, those kind of issues are not being dealt with because of a particular uh, projection or conclusion that was presented in the environmental review back when the rezoning was done. 
Um, the uh, agencies uh, deal with uh, their programs and their, uh, their programmatic work based on what is happening in the communities n now and what the trends are, not what was predicted in an environmental review some time ago. Can you explain what was so successful about the downtown Brooklyn rezoning and uh, the, uh, you mentioned that it was a very successful project. I just would like some more accuracy on that. Uh, we view downtown Brooklyn as a, as a thriving uh, area and community in New York City and that, um, and that the rezoning has con con contributed to the growth in that area and that neighborhood. Even though it was rezoned for office space, but it instead came high rise residential. Um, yes, and, and because zoning um, needs to retain flexibility, and zoning creates flexibility um, so that uh, the economy and the market has room. Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry. The, the economy and the, and the market can uh, has has room to allow a, a community to develop. The the in fact the the um, the downtown Brooklyn rezoning created um, a, a much needed housing supply in downtown Brooklyn, um, and it, it created and established the sort of work life live character of that neighborhood, and which also supports local businesses. So we view the, the relationship between the housing that was created, the demand for offices, the local businesses as, as having created and uh, resulting in a very thriving community. But it, we also v think it's very important that um, zoning um, allows flexibility. And if zoning is too rigid and does not allow uh, things like housing demand to be met, then uh, it curtails investment and it curtails investment in, in businesses and in housing. And so with that, for that reason, we, we, uh, it's important that the rezonings and our zoning designations not seek to micromanage what can happen, not be too rigid, but allow flexibility. So as part of this rezoning that happened in downtown Brooklyn, are there enough schools there? How many residents were displaced and how many local businesses were displaced because of this rezoning? Did you keep track of that? Did your agency keep track of that? Um, no, as, as, as my colleague has said, we don't go back afterwards and look at um, the precise impact of the rezoning or other forces or, uh, in comparison to what had been predicted at the time of an environmental review. And we recognize that um, rezoning has uh, changes or can have an impact on a neighborhood, but lots of, um, there are other influencing factors too. As in terms of school and school need, I would defer to my colleague from I, I just, I'm just, that, that answer is just like, doesn't fit right with me. You know, when you, when you write a paragraph or you write something, you always go back and you check it for accuracy to ensure that you're not mispronouncing words or that things are accurate. How can the city of New York put a report out, submit it to the city council, and then not go back and double check to see how accurate that report was. I, I think it's important just to um, focus on what the role and the purpose of environmental review is, which is when But the, the accuracy of it, you're not double checking to see how accurate it is. No, we take great pains um, and go through significant process to make sure that an environmental review is based on the best available information at the time the review is, is prepared. Um, but it is a forward-looking disclosure document that's purpose is to help decision makers make a decision. It's one piece of information that decision makers use to make decisions. It's not the, entire, uh, the entirety of what they base a decision on. In terms of later, there's a difference and an important difference between the analysis and projections in an environmental review and the programs and governance um, of agencies and how agencies like SCA or DOT or HPD or others make decisions on a citywide basis, not simply on a, in an area that's been rezoned about where schools are needed, where transportation network needs to be uh, improved. And that's done on a, on a on a more citywide basis and not looking simply at an area that's been rezoned. 
You know, the city of New York is trying to move forward with these studies that will lead to rezonings. And we in the council, the community, community boards depend on the city to provide us with accurate data. How can you expect us to trust your reports when you're not fact checking or double checking your, the, what you've, your recommendations? Well, reiterating what my colleague from DCP said, environmental review, since it's a forward-looking disclosure document, as I mentioned also, we take the data that we have at the time, have it vetted through multiple, have the use that data in analysis and have it vetted through multiple um, technical agencies to make sure that we all are in agreement as to what we see are the future um, projections, for, particularly with the rezoning that are happening across the neighborhood across 5, 10, 15 years. We also know, as Susan mentioned, that the agencies that are responsible for implementing mitigation measures or responsible for providing those services like SCA and DOT at, or DEP at the time are also built into their operating process they use the environmental review for strategic planning. It alerts them to what is happening in the city, but they also, on a regular basis, are checking what is actually happening in reality after the environmental review is projected. So there isn't a look back to the environmental review, but there's a look back in the real moment in time as to what is happening and what needs to be offered to deal with the concerns that were identified in the environmental review. So there's not the periodic look back to the environmental review, there's the real time look, look at what's happening on the ground through, through those agencies. Even with mitigation measures that are identified in an environmental review in some areas like transportation, DOT does look at whether what was identified in the environmental review has come to fruition does the analysis again, so to speak, and then implements what other mitigation measure is appropriate at that moment in time to make sure that it's actually addressing the issue that has come to fruition. All right, I'm gonna come back with a second round of questions on this uh, particular topic. I'm gonna give an opportunity for Chair Moya to ask some questions. Thank you, uh, Chair Salamanca. Thank you all again for being here and for uh, giving your testimony. Uh, just a, a couple of questions. Uh, the City Environmental Quality Review uh, Technical Manual, as uh, we know, as uh, the Seeker Manual, is used to assess, disclose, and mitigate the significant environmental consequences of a project, such as a neighborhood rezoning. Uh, do you think that Seeker is uh, an effective uh, fact-finding process? Thank you, council member. That's a great question. We are very committed to making sure that Seeker is the most robust and comprehensive fact-finding process. Uh, we, it is a guidance document and is a living document, so there's always room for improvement. We are planning the launch of a Seeker technical manual update. We are eager to work with council and members, stakeholders of the public to inform the, the methodologies in the, the tech manual. Um, and we, we, it is one of the most rigorous and robust in the nation and we you know, are strongly committed to keeping and maintaining that reputation. Thank you. And are there currently uh, better research tools out there uh, that are not being used under Seeker uh, to predict things like business uh, and residential displacement uh, and even uh, school overcrowding? We, we are all very interested in the academic pursuit of environmental review methodologies. Um, all of the technical agencies main, uh, stay abreast of the proposed methodologies and we have considered them. We, at the time, we, we are, there are some methodologies that we would like to take a, better, a more rigorous look at. We are planning to do so in the Seeker Tech Manual update, and as a, again, as we are eager to collaborate with the council and the stakeholders to identify those. So just going with that, if those tools existed, uh, and you're saying that there's the 
a new update coming, would you want uh, that to be incorporated or updated in the secret manual? We would like to engage with uh, uh, the public and the council about their ideas for different methodologies, and if we if we deem that they are uh, would maintain our most rigorous standard of environmental review, um, we are committed to considering them. Great. Uh, okay. So according to the Rent Guidelines Board, uh, since 1994 at a total of 200,000 uh, uh, rent stabilized units have been deregulated in New York City. In 2017 alone, we lost 6,657 units of rent stabilized housing. Uh, the council and the administration have agreed to adopt several pieces of legislation uh, and allocated significant resources to protect tenants in rent stabilized buildings from harassment and displacement, and also to stem the tide of the loss of rent stabilized housing. And while the Department of Housing uh, Preservation and Development and Human Resources Administration are focusing on, on policies and resources on this reality, Seeker does not acknowledge the vulnerability of residents in rent stabilized housing stock. Seeker does not consider rent stabilized buildings as possible projected development sites or consider rent increase which lead to displacement in rent stabilized buildings um, despite evidence across New York City that these buildings are being uh, vacated or demolished in strengthening the real estate market. Will you consider adjusting the seeker manual analysis and methodology to acknowledge that low income residents in rent stabilized buildings could be considered a population at risk of displacement. Again, we are committed to working with the council and the public at looking at the best methodologies and committed to considering the best methodology proposed. But do, do you see that, that yes, well, this not, is yes. a real threat to a lot of New Yorkers and the housing stock, especially in rent stabilized communities and buildings that is not included in the seeker manual? Right. To say, yes, you're giving me a very general answer that says we will consider all options. I think there needs to be an acknowledgement that this is crucial to the future of the city of New York and many of the most vulnerable uh, in our society right now that will be affected by this. Yes, we acknowledge that the Seeker Tech Manual currently looks at uh, residents in non-regulated housing as the most vulnerable to displacement. Uh, we work closely with our partners at HPD um, to coordinate the efforts that they are uh, undertaking to keep people in place in their apartments. We, as a, the administration, is formally supportive of keeping residents in place, and these rezonings are being approached to, uh, to protect affordable housing. And when we launch the Seeker Tech Manual update, we are firmly committed to considering methodologies to improve uh, keeping the, that, um, that goal of keeping residents in place in their neighborhoods. Um, some of the considerations that we have for updating the methodologies are the data that are available. My colleagues at City Planning or HPD can speak more to that. Um, but we, we, when we look at mitigation measures, we coordinate closely with HPD to, uh, to look at the programs that they have to keep residents in place in their regulated housing. Well, I look forward to working with all of you on that. Thank you. Um, so a, a detailed analysis of the socioeconomic impact of a project is sometimes uh, conducted to determine the impact of a proposed project on the socioeconomic character of a neighborhood relative to the expected non-action scenario. Uh, a detailed analysis would be uh, triggered if the project leads to the direct displacement of at least 500 residents or results in a substantial new development that is mark marked differently from existing uses within the neighborhood. Uh, these thresholds are usually not met, and though many have argued broad actions such as neighborhood rezonings often impact the character of a neighborhood, Chapter 2, page 3 of the Seeker Manual states that lower thresholds to trigger a full socioeconomic assessment 
may be appropriate depending on the characteristic of the study area. The question is, what are these characteristics and how are they identified and evaluated? Um, thank you, council member, for that question. It's a, a very complex uh, question. Um, I think the character. It's okay. I, right, right, I, right. I, right. I, 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 even, right, we, right. I, we understand. Methodologies how this works, are so, so complex that even experts like myself cannot speak specifically to them in a public hearing like this, but we are happy to follow up with you. Um, after the hearing and discuss further the methodology. So you don't have in the that manual. here? I don't have that here, no. So. Has there been, uh, has a threshold ever uh, changed as a result of these characteristics that you know of? Or is this one of those where you still have to get back to me on? Uh, yes, we have extensive records of the previous uh, tech manual updates and I can look through them and see what the, the impetus for a change in that methodology may have been in the past. Okay. And we are happy to follow up with you yep. at your convenience. Thank you. Uh, okay, so based on your knowledge of previous neighborhood rezonings, uh, can you tell us if there's been any discrepancies between the original seeker uh, predictive analysis of residential displacement and what actually occurred? Um, my, my colleague from city planning will take that question. Um, we do, uh, th thank you for that question. So, um, and, I, and I do um, want to say that we are uh, very committed to uh, affordable housing and to uh, creating uh, affordable housing in communities, um, particularly in areas that uh, have uh, uh, high housing demand. Um, we do a very, uh, I think, rigorous analysis in environmental reviews of um, trends in housing in a particular uh, neighborhood when we do the rezoning. Um, what uh, uh, the housing stock is, what the uh, demand for housing is, what the regulated and non-regulated housing is, um, what would likely happen in a community without a rezoning, and what uh, is likely to happen in a community with a rezoning. And so there's a comparison between what the rezoning adds and what the future will be without the rezoning. It, it doesn't assume that a neighborhood will remain static as is at the time. Um, one of the things um, that, we, that we do rezonings for, one of the driving impetus of rezoning is to create uh, more affordable housing and to preserve housing that exists in neighborhoods. And, and one of the ways we think that, the, that is best to address housing demand is to in fact create enough new housing to, uh, to meet demand um, and to create affordable housing. Um, and we've done that uh, in our neighborhood rezonings um, by uh, encouraging uh, new housing and making sure that new housing has a percentage and a significant percentage of housing that is reserved as permanently affordable housing. Um, we, uh, those rezonings and the permanent affordable housing program have happened in the last several years. Um, they uh, are still, the impacts, the effects, how they will play themselves out are still occurring. Um, and uh, uh, we are, um, but we- Which but sounds we, like a study may be necessary to take a look back at what's going on. Well, we don't think it's necessary to go back and look at whether what was projected in the environmental review at you know, last year or two years ago or three years ago in, in 10 years or 15 years turned out to be accurate. What we do think is important is that the HPD programs and the other programs that are designed to protect uh, tenants and to create affordable housing have the information they need at the time to enable them the programs to function and for them to uh, uh, really fulfill their mandates. And so it's not so much what did we predict but what is happening in a community at a particular time. So my question was about discrepancies. Are you saying there's been no discrepancies? I, I'm, we have not, I know my, my, the, we have not looked 
to see whether there is a discrepancy. Um, and, and as I said, we don't think that that's necessarily the, um, the, the way that we would want to, uh, the anal an analysis that would help us uh, in the future um, and, and even now um, run our programs uh, and determine what housing needs are and how best to provide affordable housing. So you, you're all pitching a perfect game right now. There's, there's no discrepancies. Everything seems to be going as planned. Got it. Um, is there a point at which you would say a neighborhood rezoning um, had met its goals? And can you explain your process for reviewing a neighborhood rezoning that's reached the point uh, you identified and how those results were used to improve the process for an upcoming uh, rezoning plans? Um, neighborhoods are dynamic, and so um, we would not look and say uh, a neighborhood here has achieved X or Y. We believe that um, by enabling uh, new housing, by encouraging new housing, by encouraging um, a or, or by requiring, not encouraging, a specific portion a significant portion of new housing to be, uh, to include affordable housing, to allow, uh, to focus uh, development and, and housing in transit rich areas, um, to uh, encourage and allow businesses to support housing, um, that a rezoning by doing all that is uh, successful. Um, I've asked about this before, but um, I want to take a, a look at the Long Island City uh, neighborhood rezoning. Uh, the seeker uh, analysis estimated that 300 new units of housing would be created. Uh, do you know how many were actually created? Um, I do not. Um, I can. Uh, 10,000. Okay. 10,000. So now I'm going to go back to something you said earlier. So do you still stand by saying? you take the most conservative approach when it comes to the, doing these neighborhood rezonings and predicting the effects of what it's going to have on a community? We, as I said, Seeker is forward looking, so we cannot identify trends that may change things, particularly with a rezoning over time, but we attempt to make the most uh, conservative, conservative approach with a reasonable worst case development scenario. Um, with regard to whether we're pitching a perfect game, uh, we hope that in most cases we are overestimating uh, the potential for environmental impacts. Right. 10,000. Since we can Downtown Brooklyn, 979, 8,000 units were created. Right. But since we cannot predict some trends that are outside the scope of environmental review, we are aware that we may not always be pitching a perfect game all the time. Thank you. So in both these cases, the seeker analysis did not come close to estimating reality. How are we supposed to effectively plan for how many teachers, firefighters, police officers will need, uh, how transit will work, how will we schedule enough uh, train services when the information that we're working on is so inaccurate? Well, as we, re we have said, um, thank you for the question. As we've said, the environmental review is one piece of the strategic planning process for all the agencies that are responsible for maintaining those services in the city. And we coordinate with them closely on the environmental review so that they are aware of the pending changes in neighborhoods, particularly with the case of rezoning. But we, they also do not rely on the environmental review and there's as part of their uh, operating processes they go back and look at the existing conditions so that they can make adjustments to maintain those services in the communities notwithstanding the envi you know the environmental review that had occurred five years or ten years prior the seeker manual uh, includes a specific threshold to use uh, in determining a significant adverse impact on residential displacement. Uh, the manual states, 
that if the vulnerable population, low-income residents identified through a detailed socioeconomic analysis exceeds 5% of the population of the study area, a significant impact may occur. As city planning has discretion in determining whether there is or is not a significant impact, can you please explain uh, to us how this decision is made? Um, thank you for that. Um, and, I'm, and I'm happy to explain the displacement analysis that we do in environmental reviews. Um, um, as, a, as a general matter, what we do is we look at development trends, uh, housing trends, uh, housing demand in a neighborhood. Um, this is just for the displacement, the residential displacement analysis. We look at the availability of housing stock the current availability of housing stock, the amount of stock housing that is uh, regulated, the amount of housing that is government provided, the amount of housing that is not the population that lives in a neighborhood, and we project it to the future. Uh, we project it to the future for what the analysis year is going to be. And then we project uh, with the rezoning what our reasonable worst case development scenario suggests will be uh, the housing stock and the population um, with the trends that have already existed in a neighborhood, um, and we project that into the future, and then the, the uh, significance of uh, any impact is determined by the difference between the future with the action and the future without the action. We do um, believe very strongly that um, the, one of the central purposes of rezonings is to uh, provide additional housing, uh, and by providing additional housing that we, are dis that we are addressing displacement pressures that may exist in a neighborhood, that by ensuring that a large percentage of that housing is affordable housing, that we are helping to protect the most vulnerable populations in a neighborhood, and that, um, that the combination of new housing preservation of existing housing and ensuring that uh, housing is, a, is a permanently, maintained as permanently affordable, reduces uh, uh, displacement pressures that may exist in neighborhoods, um, and uh, neighborhoods have displacement pressures in the city, uh, both those that are being rezoned and those that are not. We look at rezoning as a very key way of addressing those uh, pressures. <coughs> The city's new mandatory inclusionary housing program, or MIH, uh, has been mapped in recent rezonings and has been cited as a reason why you don't anticipate a significant impact or require additional mitigation. Can you please explain why you believe uh, MIH can significantly reduce the risk of residential displacement? Um, MIH ensures that private housing that is built has a significant percentage of housing reserved for affordability. There are different levels of affordability, um, but they go into deep affordability by creating, as I said, both new housing and ensuring that a significant portion of that new housing or opportunities for new housing, but then requiring that a significant portion of that new housing be reserved for uh, be permanently reserved uh, for affordable households, uh, we believe that that very directly addresses displacement pressures that communities may already be feeling at the time uh, a rezoning is suggested. And while the socioeconomic characteristic of the specific vulnerable population at risk of displacement uh, because of a neighborhood rezoning may be similar to the socioeconomic characteristic of residents who qualify of housing through the mandatory inclusionary housing program, housing created through uh, MIH won't necessarily be occupied by those specific residents at risk of displacement. Is it prudent to consider MIH as a valuable strategy to mitigate the impacts of residential displacement? Um, yes, thank you. We, we very much believe it is appropriate to consider MIH as a, uh, as a um, means of preserving affordable housing in a neighborhood and um, helping the existing population in a neighborhood uh, retain uh, levels of affordability. 
Um, it's not the only program that exists. HPD has other programs that exist that protect uh, tenants, um, and uh, we look at everything in combination. Got it. Uh, do you believe is that is there room for improvement in how we go about rezoning uh, entire neighborhoods, and how are we supposed to improve this process of rezoning entire neighborhoods when we're not gathering information? Uh, on these shortcomings? Um, I, would, I would say in everything, uh, there is room for improvement. Um, I, I don't think there's anything that anyone does anywhere that couldn't be improved in some way, shape, or form. I'm glad to hear that. Um, we, we do uh, believe we do a very good job on rezoning, that we um, identify and we work with communities uh, well in advance of proposed rezonings to understand what a community uh, is looking for, what the community needs are. We uh, work with council members um, and we proceed um, uh, when a community is interested in rezoning and the council member supports rezoning, when there's opportunities to create housing and, and we're in a, transit, uh, in, a, in a transit area that can support it. Um, we do look forward to working with uh, the Mayor's Office of Environmental Coordination on the CICRA technical manual update, um, and I'm sure that there will be suggestions that uh, will be made for how analyses can be approved, and um, we, we do look forward to um, looking at those suggestions and continuing that conversation. Thank you. Uh, and just two more questions, and then I'm going to turn it back over to, to the Chair. Uh, when it deals to school capacity and overcrowding uh, in community school districts, uh, sub-districts where overcrowding exists today, uh, in the future with no action and the future with action scenarios, uh, can you please explain the rationale uh, for why there should not be a lower threshold for impacts to schools than a 5% increase in utilization rates uh, with the proposed actions? Um, I think my colleague from SEA, who's available still, um, should answer the question. Um. Can we uh, swear you in uh, before you begin? Please state your name and raise your right hand. Melanie LaRocca. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committees and answer to all council member questions? Yes. Thank you, Councilmember Chair Moya. Um, I would say that we've had a very productive uh, relationship with our colleagues in government, uh, particularly with uh, the Mayor's Office of Environmental Coordination. And as they uh, begin the process of looking at updates to the techni technical manual, I do expect that we will hear, as we have in the past, from stakeholders um, uh, questions about whether the 5% threshold should remain. And, and congratulations, Commissioner, on uh, the wonderful uh, new role that you will be taking and look forward to working with you as well. Thank you. Um, just a quick follow-up to that. Is there anything that restricts you from lowering the threshold for impacts in sub-districts where overcrowding exists today? I don't know the legal answer to that, so I would suspect that there is probably a legal uh, reason, but again, as the technical manual update process begins, um, we've certainly heard questions uh, in the past at different forums, whether it's from the council or members of the community who have expressed an interest in um, seeing changes to that 5%. So, I would, I would respectfully say I don't know the legal answer, whether there is one to that question, um, but I certainly expect to hear through the tech manual updates um, a strong desire to see that number move. Uh, NSCA housing uh, projections uh, used to determine future school capacity relies on permit applications for new housing or known planned projects. Uh, this approach is less useful for projects several years out, uh, as few developers seek building permits six to ten years before construction begins. Uh, as these projects are, are used to determine the future needs of a community, 
uh, in the seeker no action scenario and often uh, underestimate growth in years six to 10, the resulting cumulative impact of the project could produce an inaccurate picture uh, of the future needs. Should city planning consider a more accurate projection model uh, for seeker? So I would say this, yes, we work with city planning very closely, and yes, we have heard, particularly from the council, uh, a very strong interest in seeing ways, in finding ways to um, better identify potential out year uh, growth in that six to 10 uh, year. As everybody here I think knows, um, we uh, work very closely with city planning, with Department of Buildings, with HPD, EDC, and others on identifying potential, what we would call housing pipeline. Um, and that is identifying potential growth, whether it's through actual permits issued or um, projects that are making their way through the CEQA process or known and projected growth. So that could be both um, as a right conditions or future secret, uh, uh, ULERP actions. Um, so we've expressed certainly an interest in finding opportunities to strengthen our process and we would certainly be open uh, to conversations about uh, ways in which we can, with city planning um, and our other stakeholders, figure out ways to uh, make our planning process more robust. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm just gonna end uh, by saying that um, I believe that if we don't learn from our mistakes, uh, then we're doomed to repeat them. Uh, if this city isn't held accountable and doesn't take responsibility for what it gets wrong, then I think that we're very unlikely that it's going to correct its course at all by itself. Uh, take the lead, uh, take the, the, the lead poison uh, scandal at NYCHA, for instance, when the city fails to investigate how its decisions affect the thousands and thousands of New Yorkers who live in these rezoned areas, it is essentially saying to the people who were harmed, oh well, we just don't care. Uh, and it seems to me that we're treating New York City residents in primarily low income minority communities as guinea pigs in a badly designed experiment. We rezone these neighborhoods, we give the community uh, markets a shot in the arm and manufacture the conditions for wholesale development. But then we never follow up to compare the results of our original hypothesis, the seeker, that seeker pred predict predictions. So I don't know if it's just laziness, I don't know if it's arrogance, but it's certainly, I feel irresponsible um, that it's the city's duty to serve all New Yorkers uh, and I think that it's not just the developers and lobbyists. And we dedicate tons of resources and time and money to edu uh, educated guesses about how these neighborhood rezonings may play out. I think we owe it to everyone that is affected by these rezonings and the next community in line to find out how they will turn out. Uh, and this is why I believe the two bills that I've introduced are extremely important. We are asking for a study uh, I don't think that that is uh, something that is out of the universe to not consider uh, taking a look back to see if what is uh, being implemented now working in our communities and especially as we move forward in the future. So thank you very much for your testimony today. I do appreciate it. I hope we do follow up with uh, the questions that uh, we had discussed before. And thank you to the chair and to my colleagues for uh, allowing me the time to ask uh, these questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Moya. Uh, just some uh, committee procedures, uh, just uh, to put it on the record, the roll is closed for today's votes. Uh, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned about updating the manual, the seeker manual. Uh, will the community play a role in changes? Um. Thank you for that question. As I said, we are eager to work with the community and council to look at the appropriate updates for the Seeker Tech Manual, and we are committed to engaging with stakeholders um, to consider all methodologies. What's the timeline? When are you uh, planning on um, making changes to this manual? We don't have the timing yet, but we are working to have that happen as soon as possible, and we will work with council to make that happen. All right, and, and so is, uh, 
having community meetings or having community input in the works already? We are looking at how we will work on that process and how that process will work, yes. All right, I'm gonna take you on your word on that. Um, just have a, a few questions and then I'm gonna uh, allow uh, Council Member Barron and Reynoso and then Miller. Um, do you believe the issue of displacement, whether it's residential or commercial as, as a result of land use actions are real? Um, I am a resident of New York City. I think the issue of displacement is real. I am, my background is an environmental lawyer, so I can't really, in terms of land use, can't speak to where the triggers are, but I, you know, this administration has recognized this, uh, as DCP has said, the, the impetus for MIH rezoning is to keep people in place, and we, you know, we do treat it seriously in the tech manual, whether, you know, we can differ on whether the methodology is appropriate, but yes, it is a real issue for New York City, and I agree. So why do you, um, then why do so few projects have EIS reports that conclude that there is no correlation between displacement and land use actions? Um, I think that, thank you for that question. I think in a broad sense, uh, as we said, environmental review is a forward-looking document that has certain criteria and many of the trends that lead to displacement are not in the purview of environmental review to identify. But um, again, this is something that we were eager to follow up with council and stakeholders as to how we can refine the methodologies potentially to identify them. All right, I wanna go back to those questions on displacement as well. I'm gonna allow uh, council member uh, Barron uh, to ask some questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you to the panel for coming. I've heard your testimony and I didn't hear any reference to what your position is on Reso 9. So I'd like to ask what is your position on the legislation which I have introduced, which is Reso 9. Um, the administration does not comment on resolutions. We comment on legislation. Um, Substantively, as I said, we are committed to maintaining the most rigorous and comprehensive environmental review process, and we are open and eager to discuss with council what that okay, will look like. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Amron, is that how it's pronounced? Yes. What makes you say that the downtown Brooklyn rezoning was successful? Um, we view downtown Brooklyn uh, as a very successful rezoning. Um, it created a much needed housing supply. Clearly there was a lot of de housing demand in downtown Brooklyn, created the opportunity for that. Uh, it created sort of the character of downtown Brooklyn as sort of a live work area where people have housing, there are jobs in the area. Um, it supports the local businesses and uh, downtown Brooklyn is a thriving community in New York and we look at that as successful. Was that what it was supposed to do? Create housing? The uh, reason I thought it was a project for uh, commercial office space. I thought that that was what it was designed to do. The, the rezoning allowed um, a number of different uses. Okay. When the environmental review was done. Here comes your note. Excuse me? Your note. What note? No. Oh. Um, I'm sorry. Um, yes. Uh, when downtown, when the FEIS for the downtown Brooklyn was rezoning, it was anticipated that uh, uh, at the time that there would be uh, more office space created and the amount of housing and the housing demand was not anticipated. Let me just interject. You said it was anticipated. That wasn't the objective. The objective was not for? I, I cannot speak right now to the objective of a downtown rezoning. I can speak to the environmental review for the downtown But I think rezoning. that that is what 
decides if something is successful, if you achieve what you said you wanted to do. So I think that for you to come and say it was successful and not be able to tell us what the outcome, what the objective was at the onset, is a disconnect there. I think the rezoning in downtown Brooklyn allowed a array of uses. Um, it allowed and, and encouraged office building. It also allowed residential. Um, it was, at the time, the anticipation was that there would be more office and less residential, but the demand for housing and the forces, and there were a lot of things that happened in New York City between the FEIS and the, and the rezoning and now has, has resulted in a community that the demand for housing was met first. There is now an increasing demand for office space in downtown Brooklyn. And so it's responding to the economic trends um, and the demands of the community. But we look at the community and we look at downtown Brooklyn as a thriving community with uh, housing, with jobs, with businesses, and if, that's successful. If all of those factors as they presently exist were accommodated by schools and transportation and other amenities and infrastructure, then that might be able to be said that it was successful. But based on the density of what's there and the lack of the uh, agents, the facilities that are needed, I wouldn't say that it was successful. I would qualify that. Uh, when I was asked to serve as a principal at a school, it was called a school in need of improvement, I was told that the school had certain criteria and that for the next three years, the state was watching that school to make sure that those criteria were met. So there was an analysis of, analysis of what had happened and a projection and expectation of what should be the uh, data at the end of the three years. I don't know how we can have an agency come before us and not look back on data that you had at the beginning to say whether or not you've been successful, to seem to even reject the fact that you can look back to do an evaluation. Uh, in, your, in your testimony, you said environmental review cannot and should not be expected to predict the future with the degree of precision that is implied in these bills. Environmental review is also not a tool that looks back to identify causes of current conditions. We're not asking you to identify the causes. We're asking you to look back and say if, in fact, the product that we have matches or comes close to what we said we wanted to do at the outset. So if your projections were made at the outset, and if the trends continued, or if things stayed static, or if they continued in the way that they existed, and no other hurricanes or economic conditions came in, would you expect to have achieved what you said you wanted to have at the outset? If there were none of these other intervening factors, do you think that you should be able to look back and say we were successful, or that you just throw your hands up and say, well, we did our part, we made the projections, we said what we thought it would be, and whatever it is, that's what it is? It seems to me that you don't think that you have a responsibility to give us an evaluation as to why you may not have achieved what it is that you thought you would achieve. Are we asking developers to give us an accounting? Are we looking for developers to ensure that they did what they said they would do? Is there that requirement? Are there consequences if they didn't do? Or do we not care? Do we just see it on paper and say, okay, it's there. Let's move on. Um, we do look at downtown Brooklyn as a success. Um, when we rezone an area or, or even under our current zone, the current zoning in an area, if we are not rezoning it, um, we have uh, development uh, in that area that responds to the economy and to demand. And so if there's a demand for housing, uh, we would anticipate that development responds to that. If there's a development uh, demand for other uses, we would expect that, develop, that uh, development respond to that. We, we do think it's important that zoning be flexible and that, and that uh, when we rezone an area or an undercurrent zoning, that that flexibility be maintained and we not try and 
precisely manage what happens in a dynamic and growing city, but that we allow the city um, to grow and neighborhoods to grow uh, uh, as, as, they, as they should. Um, we uh, do, and I, I guess I don't want to repeat too much, but we do look at downtown Brooklyn as a very successful rezoning. Um, we, uh, uh, well, I would ask that you get back to me with what the, uh, the, at the outset was the intention. You keep saying that, and I keep saying to you, it has to be based on what you expected to achieve, and you said you didn't know that. So I, and, you and said, I, I, is that what you said, maybe? I, I said I can't go now and say what what right. The, so I, I think we should put that on hold because you keep talking about the success without being able to tell me what it was at the beginning. But I do have other questions. Um, you talk about you have changes to uh, the circuit in 2001, 10, 12, and 14. Why were changes made, and what had happened in the previous versions that required or made an impact on those changes? Um, thank you very much for that question. It's a very uh, interesting question. Um, there's many different reasons why changes were made. Um, I can speak at a high level to reasons why but um, we can, are happy to discuss with more, more detail following the hearing. Um, first is some of the, for some of the technical areas, the criteria is based on other standards like state standards and federal standards um, for air quality, for... Um, so was it based on the fact that previously the standards were not uh, appropriate? No, uh, environmental review is a living process uh, as technology and scientific theories develop uh, criteria changes all the time. Um, for example, with regard to air quality, uh, with the way the Clean Air Act works, um, areas become in attainment and non-attainment for different types of uh, contaminant, air contaminants, and so depending on what the condition of uh, the the, the air quality in New York is, um, there's different uh, criteria for impact, the federal and state standards change and evolve um, for areas that become, we do, for example, look at climate change, that is an evolving, uh, theories are evolving <coughs> about climate change and we try to stay, as I say, as relevant and state of the art as possible. Okay, and what is the process for the change? Um, the process for the change, it's led by my office, um, we oversee, we, we uh, engage with first the technical agencies who are, own their methodologies because they are the ones that are responsible for implementing the mitigation measures. Um, the process at times, if it's a, a sort of a low level update for a criteria change based on a standard, um, it, we might just initiate the change. Uh, the more robust updates have always involved public engagement and, reach, and engagement with stakeholders in the practice. Is there any opportunity for any of the agencies to object to something being, or does your office have the final say? Um, it's a very collaborative and consensual, consensual, uh, consensus-based approach, and yes, agencies do have the opportunity to object. Um, Sometimes, because of objections, we we uh, we we put uh, we work we work together in trying to overcome those objections. But um, we try to get full agreement with all the agencies. Can your office make changes to the circuit uh, independent of the charter? Do you make changes independent of the city charter? Do you have control over what goes into that yes, document. Yes, the city charter does authorize us to maintain the tech manual, including making... So you don't need the city charter to implement any of the things that you want to change? They, they give us the mandate to implement. So you have the ability to make changes? Yes, but without, we, without we, we... We have a standard where we do not make changes without consensus of the technical agencies, and we don't make uh, more robust changes without engagement. The, any change that might be made unilaterally by my office is 
an error. It's a very complex document and it is. Does the city the charter have to approve the changes that you make? Um, is there a requirement I'm, I'm, that? I'm sorry, I don't understand. There is no approval process outlined. In so this your section. office can say, we're changing this section, we're changing that section, we're doing other sections. What's the involvement? Well, it's, it's, it's not, there's no, it's guidance, so right. it's not subject to. And is the city council a part of that process as well? The city council has been engaged in the past, yes. So the city council can say, these are changes that we would like to see. Right, and we discuss whether they are the appropriate methodologies, but, over, but it's, since it's guidance, and we often sometimes, well, not often, but at times. So can the city council pass these laws, and then we're going to say, OK, we've passed them, and this is what we want you to do? Excuse me, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. The, as, as the laws that are proposed here. As they proceed, then you would have to implement them. Well, the, the laws that are proposed, I guess, would be incorporated in the process of the tech manual, but it would, that's an interesting question. Well, I'll have to get back to you on the procedure since it's guidance and not subject to CAFA. Okay, um, just a few more questions. Getting back once again to the downtown business, if you could let me know how many businesses existed in that area previous to the rezoning and what became of those businesses, uh, were any of them returned to that area? And um, what, if not, do you know what became of those businesses? If, if you may not have that now, but I'd like to know that going forward. And just finally, that if I had a toothache and I went to a dentist and he said, oh, you, you've got you know, some infection here, we gotta do some work, we gotta do some drilling. When he finished drilling, I would wanna know that he could evaluate it, go back in and look at it and see if he had done, if what he had done was appropriate or was it something needed or was it something else. I wouldn't just be satisfied to say, okay, we've done this in not go back to get an evaluation. And that same thing applies. I think it's just sort of cavalier or irresponsible to not want to go back and make an evaluation based on what the initial uh, assessment or analysis was. Uh, thank you to the chairs. Thank, thank you. Uh, I would now uh, turn it over to Council Member Reynoso uh, for a couple of questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just, um, I feel like there's a disconnect here between what we're talking about and what you're presenting. Maybe it's because you lived in your silo and maybe we live in ours, um, but there's a, a, a complete disconnect. The fact that you believe Seeker requires some changes because everything requires changes or everything can be improved um, and not speak to like the gross, uh, miscalculations made by whatever formula um, exists in the seeker manual. That you would come in here and say that the downtown Brooklyn um, rezoning was a success and that is something you're proud of. Um, it's just, it's beyond me. And the chair said something, he said arrogance, I think is how, how I feel about what your department believes of the work that you do. And in, in an opportunity to grow and improve ourselves, one side can't come to the table arrogantly. One side can't come to the table not thinking that there are significant issues with a document that is proven fl flawed. And I'm gonna give uh, a, a show of your arrogance and then a show of what I consider is ignorance. The arrogance comes from the secret technical manual, quote, this was said by Ms. Uh, Ms. Amel, uh, quote, the seeker technical manual, while a living document, like all technical guidance, has been cited as one of the most rigorous environmental analysis guidance documents that allows for one of the most comprehensive environmental impact review processes in the nation. But what I think that that says more clear than anything is, you work harder, not smarter. You might put more money into a, a review process, but your outcomes are not necessarily something to cheer. For. So I want to make it clear to the nation 
Because if this is something that the nation thinks you do a good job, but I wanna, I wanna do something very quickly. Downtown Brooklyn, which you stated as a success, and that's something that you believe Seeker did right. Um, and, and I wanna be clear, I think you're the only people in this room that might believe that. The administration believes that the downtown Brooklyn rezoning was a success under the qualifications of the Seeker. In 2002, there have been 10,000 new residents that have moved into the study area. Uh, the city planning, Re, uh, commission and rezoning said it would only generate 979 units. 979. 10,000 people can't live in 979 units. I want to be clear. Uh, 3,000 units of housing were built, not 979. You were off by 75%. That's like a, a, a 0 0.7 uh, on a grade. You've grossly failed at predicting the future one time there. Then, uh, you said there were gonna be 446 new school age children. Instead, there are 4,000. That's 10 times, you were wrong by 10 times. So congratulations that you think it's a success, but anyone reading straight data, which is what you do, would never make that statement. That, that's an that's a incorrect statement, and I think it's, it's either you don't wanna see change, or, or you're, you don't get it. So I, I, wanna, I wanna assume that it's the first, that you guys just don't wanna change anything because I actually think that this is beneficial to developers in making sure that we limit the mitigation so that they can build in this city um, and not care about the impacts of the residents that currently live there. But for you to say that downtown Brooklyn was successful, I wasn't here when you said that, but it was repeated by somebody, one of the chairs, was unbelievable to me. That even the council member that is from there that did that rezoning believes there was missteps hap that happened there. The current council member that's there. So it's, it's extremely frustrating to see you do that. Um, so just, th that's data. So I hope we could re-engage re where we have a more honest conversation because it's not honest right now and it's frustrating. Um, Seeker was, was created a long time ago with scopes and, and, and formulas and whatever you want to call it that were relative to a city of that time. We have a new city that's growing at a pace that Seeker couldn't figure out that we couldn't figure out, that past mayors weren't prepared for, no one was prepared for it. But the city now has to accommodate all these new residents. The least we can do is look to push a seeker manual that actually prepares us for the future, that speaks to displacement, that speaks to the need for parks. I wanna talk about that too. The one thing that did come out of the study in the downtown Brooklyn area was that they were gonna get two parks, J Street Plaza and Willoughby Square Park. And guess where those parks are? Nowhere to be found. They're not done. They're not completed. So the one thing you mitigate for in a reasonable way is not even completed. It's just I'm very frustrated that you came in here, and I believe it's arrogance to think that this is a, a small problem that might need minor changes to it. I, I think it needs significant changes. And downtown Brooklyn is an example. And I come from a place called Williamsburg, Brooklyn, where you made huge mistakes. There's no way unless, and if you accounted for this in Seeker, then you are part of the problem and part of the reason why 30,000 Latinos were displaced in 10 years. You did that intentionally if you don't think you have a problem with your manual. The manual needs to be modified so it can speak to real world problems. And until we don't have an administration that sits in front of here, recognizes its faults, and looks to solutions, we're gonna be, we're, this is gonna be a battle that I don't think you're gonna win, I wanna be clear. That's why I've implemented, I want changes to the charter to speak to a better environmental impact study because what's happening is that in these black and brown communities where most of these rezonings are happening is where the displacement is happening. Where in Queens there's no seats for these kids because your seeker manual fails miserably. So just stop saying that you think something is successful unless you give me the reason in a, in a, real, in a, real, world, in a real world data set. Uh, the regular review, this is another thing that's important. It's the only document where you fail miserably and you don't need a review, but you're allowed to, to, to there's no accountability, I guess is what I'm saying. In, in no other business can you fail so bad and not have any repercussions. There's no look back. If my son takes a test and does a bad job, I want him to look back at the test so that he can improve and do better in the future. You don't do that. You fail and you just keep it moving. Keep it moving while my people are getting displaced. I want that after a certain amount of time, you can look back at it and say, look, we messed up here and this community needs resources so we can continue to make sure that we're 
a city for all and not a tale of two cities. But ignoring that you fail miserably doesn't allow you to solve for that. And that, that's a big problem that I have. I think that the, for you to testify that way is, is, uh, is, an, is an embarrassment to the administration. I don't even want to ask questions because I think you're full of it right now. And I hope that after this, we can have a more formal conversation when you guys are honest about the fact that this is a problem that we need to solve for in a meaningful way. Thank you. I want to turn it over to Councilmember Miller um, for some questions. Deputy Leader should just drop the mic on that one, honestly. His sentiments are echoed throughout and, and what is so obvious um, by the members that stood around uh, for the conclusion of this, this hearing and to have an opportunity to speak that it is reflective of those black and brown communities, those communities that have been displaced by virtue of the work that has been done by planning um, and so, uh, as the chair of the Black, Latino, and the Asian Caucus, this is absolutely what we talk about each month. This is precisely um, the concerns of communities of color. And to hear the cavalier attitudes um, that downtown Brooklyn that Long Island City, that other rezoned, gentrified, displacing communities um, was done properly is disingenuous at best. Uh, as my colleague said, if you, man, if you were a, a major league player in batting 100, you'd be out. There is absolutely no industry standards that exist that allows you to keep a job um, with, with such a horrendous uh, track record of success. Um, but that being said, when, when we look at the lack of success in the initial planning, and I know you, you, you said it allows for individual agencies to have input, but you're having input after the fact. And so if you are looking at transportation, you are looking at transportation for significantly more people. You're looking at a significantly more dense population. So it is impacting all of municipal services, municipal services that we as a council have a responsibility as overseers of budget um, to ensure that they are being provided. How, how do we make sure that that happens? How do we, more importantly, make sure that these services get um, provided equitably? Remembering that these are 10, 15, 20,000 folks that weren't here before, services weren't being provided at necessarily a level that they should have been prior to people being displaced and now how does that happen? Is there now, does there now become a priority priority to provide transportation, schools, libraries, public service, and, and so forth? And so th this has just created a, a plethora of problems. Um, the level of involvement by the agencies uh, to this point, quite frankly, uh, I would submit that you all are complicit in not just displacing folks, um, but in creating more problems for the city and the city's budget. How do we then provide for, how, how many affordable units were created in uh, between downtown Brooklyn and Long Island City? Uh, we don't have the precise numbers. Uh, we can see if we have. How many those. units? I, we don't have the precise numbers of uh, units that were created. Uh, and was, and does anybody in here have? Does, is there an agency in here that knows how many housing units have been developed by virtue of these two plans? Um, Council Member, we can get back to you. We will discuss with the agencies and get back oh, to you. Okay, let me tell you how many units have been how many units have been developed in 
in Jamaica in the 27th district. I know precisely how many units. I know how many units are affordable. I know AMIs. I know how many are market. How could, and, and, and what scares me is that the work that we have done to maintain the integrity of communities while creating housing opportunities, economic development, could all be for naught because you guys can come in and just pivot and do things differently. So there has to be some synergy, some collaborations uh, beyond what has occurred to make sure that the people, the members that have really articulated their concerns about the communities that they serve and, and and more than 60% of the population being uh, represented by this body, this caucus, uh, I, I think lends itself to further engagement and I would hope that very serious engagement and that we take advantage of the opportunity and I would say that we very specifically look towards these members um, that are communities that are being rezoned, that, that, that you look at this caucus that represent these members as we move forward. Um, because in this case, uh, intent does not match reality. Reality is, is that not only has folks been displaced, um, there is no significant new housing being developed for them which means that they're essentially being moved out along with the businesses, but the infrastructure demands that have been created by virtue of this have not and cannot be met. When we achieve density 10 times greater than was planned, I, I just don't see where we have the, the, the resources to provide the services that are necessary. So I think that um, we certainly, the chairs, have indicated time and time again at the hearing that they are willing to sit and, and help to revamp and, and move forward. But as this is currently constituted, it just does not work. And it is really a, a sad indictment of what we have become and what we potentially will be if we keep on this track. So with, with, with that, I, I want to thank you all for coming and, and really shining light, as dim as that light may be, uh, on this situation, the chair, for your due diligence in, in bringing this up and your you. legislation and the impact um, that we can turn this thing around. Um, but right now, we're not in a good space. So thank you so much. For thank you, us. Councilmember Miller. Uh, just a few more questions. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I think you've, 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 you've suffered enough, but I just hope that you hear the frustration that is coming out of this body because of the neighborhoods that are being rezoned or in our communities. Uh, there's a reason why we've come up with this legislation. Uh, we look forward to sitting down with all of you on following up on questions that uh, we really want to get our answers to, but also uh, if the technical manual is being updated, we'd really like to have uh, ongoing dialogue on how that is implemented and updated as well. So thank you all for being here. Uh, yep, I'm sorry. If I may, um, what is the demographics of city planning? I'd have to get back to you on that, I don't know. We'll check with DKS and, and see. That, that is obviously vitally important because this is not reflective of the needs and values of, of the majority of city of New York. And I mean, we've, we've done a lot of work and I mean, we, we, we take a look at the police department and the fire department and all these crucial, what we perceive to be critical and crucial city services. But I think what you're doing is, is absolutely critical and it should be reflective of all the folks. Of, of New York City. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you, Council Member, and thank you all for your testimony today. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'd like to now call up the next panel. Uh, Marcel Negret, Thomas uh, Devaney.
Elena Conte. Thank you. Uh, if you can just state your name, and then you can uh, begin your testimony. Uh, hello, my name is Marcel Negret. I'm a planner with the Regional Plan Association. Um, the legislative package under consideration would bring important improvements to the seeker procedures evaluating the impacts of neighborhood rezonings. These bills would require additional oversight, transparency, and when necessary, the refinement of methodologies used by the Secret Technical Manual. Intro 252 is a positive step in bringing oversight and transparency to the provisions of Seeker intended to mitigate adverse impacts. Typically, environmental impact statements do not provide sufficient information about proposed mitigation measures, lacking clarity, and when or where will they be executed and who is responsible for their implementation. This, of course, uh, disincentivizes applicants and city agencies from following through with mitigation measures. 252 brings more transparency in a similar way to what the rezoning commitment tracker has done in the past. Essentially, it makes sense to bring data and wet maps to the public to bring additional transparency. The other three introductions would, in time, help refine and improve the accuracy of methodologies using the Seeker Technical Manual. In particular, introduction 1487 could help illuminate and address the extensive residential displacement documented by RPA and many others in a report that focused on the impact of rising rents and neighborhood change on low and moderate income households. RPA supports the legislative package being discussed but we believe the city could go even further. We encourage the city to explore additional efforts that takes into account the following recommendations. First, the city could develop models for proactive decision making without having to wait five years to conduct an analysis. For example, RPA developed a draft methodology for considering displacement risk in local decision making. Comparable methods could be used to inform land use changes, grant funding, housing subsidies, tax benefits, and tenant protection programs. Two. Many inaccurate predictions are a result of limited guidelines for identifying and evaluating soft sites. Identifying soft sites is the first step in the creation of the analysis framework by which development scenarios are evaluated. The city should develop a quantifiable soft site methodology that considers possible local real estate market trends, neighborhood accessibility in terms of jobs, infrastructure, and amenities, and the amount of development rates granted by zoning, among, among other indicators. This would provide site-specific criteria for projected and potential development scenarios and a more accurate disclosure document. Number three, while seeker procedures can provide important analytical information, these should not be seen as replacement to planning tools and long-term vision efforts. In particular, mitigation measures related to transportation impact should be careful as to not overemphasize approaches that would favor private vehicular infrastructure over public transit. Number four, the scope of action that would trigger the legislative package under consideration is limited to city-led rezonings encompassing four or more contiguous blocks. Our PREA recommends evaluating a broader range of actions that would trigger the transparency and oversight provisions as to include private applications and spot rezonings. A preliminary analysis suggests that the city has been relying more frequently on spot rezonings on a smaller scale, doubling the frequency of MAP amendments since 2016 compared to the prior 15 years for areas that are on average six times smaller. We appreciate the effort the City Council has made to improve Seeker. It is a good first step in a much larger discussion involving decision makers, the public, and stakeholders to arrive at cradle solutions. Thank you so much.
Good afternoon, uh, Thomas Devaney, Senior Director of Land Use and Planning at the Municipal Arts Society of New York. The Municipal Arts Society of New York has long, has long been one of the city's strongest advocates for CEQA reform. In recent years, we have published two comprehensive reports that highlight ways to strengthen the CEQA process. CEQA and climate change, released in 2009, raised the importance of measuring greenhouse gas emissions for projects subject to CEQA. Last fall, MAS released a tale of two rezonings, taking a harder look at CEQA, an in-depth, comprehensive, and comparative analysis analysis of projected and actual development fostered by the rezonings of Long Island City and downtown Brooklyn. The report also examined the environmental consequences that resulted from the gross miscalculations of development that happened under each plan. To answer the question posed on today's agenda, are secret procedures useful for accurately predicting and mitigating impacts of City Planning Commission decisions? We respond with an emphatic no. Although the downtown Brooklyn, Long Island City rezonings happened over 15 years ago, the same deficiencies and flaws remain today. We are pleased that secret reform has advanced with the legislative measures introduced today. While these proposals are commendable, we believe that more robust whole-scale changes are necessary for secret to be truly transparent, dependable, and effective. To achieve this goal, we pose several recommendations to reinforce the bills introduced today and strengthen the inherent flaws in the CEQA process. Strengthening mitigation procedures is vitally important to CEQA reform. Uh, in reference to, uh, although intro uh, 0252 seeks to improve the tracking of mitigation measures identified in environmental review documents, the bill needs to go further. In our report, MAS recommends that the draft EIS uh, the draft EISs include specific details of approved mitigation measures that address significant adverse impacts and identify the agency responsible for implementing them. Typically, DEISs provide very few details about mitigation other than to state that measures have not been approved. When details of proposed mitigation are finally made available in the final EIS, it is too late for the public to review and comment. Applicants must be held accountable, including the city, for adverse impacts of development permitted under large-scale rezonings. One way to accomplish this is to require the fulfillment of mitigation commitments as a condition for granting certificates of occupancy for new development. Further, environmental review documents must take into consideration unmitigated and unfulfilled mitigation measures from previous rezonings within a project's quarter-mile study area to effectively address the cumulative environmental impacts of a rezoning. And finally, secret lead agencies should provide follow-up technical memoranda at designated times during project construction and operation to evaluate the efficacy of identified mitigation measures. This information would provide an inventory of successful mitigation measures that could be applied to other large-scale rezonings in the secret process. In terms of improving the tracking of mitigation measures, Local Law 175 should be strengthened to include written commitments for mitigation identified in EISs, including the type, location, and schedule of specific measures, such as traffic signal changes at specific intersections. That would be implemented, monitored, and if applicable, tested for effectiveness. Excuse me. Uh, strengthening secret evaluation methodology. Intros 1487, 1523, and 1521 seek to improve secret evaluation methodology and increase transparency in areas of indirect residential displacement, traffic, and school capacity, respectively. Resolution 009 calls for improved coordination with involved city agencies in re-examining secret evaluation and mitigation criteria for impacts on neighborhood character and socioeconomic conditions. While these measures are a step in the right direction, we feel no effective change in the secret process can happen without strengthening the criteria and the methodology in the secret technical manual for establishing the worst case, the reasonable worst case development scenario, the analytical framework of secret evaluations. To, one way to accomplish this, MAS recommends using the expanded build year, build year that includes all development sites under a rezoning. Furthermore, under large-scale rezonings, a significant amount of devel development occurs on soft sites that are not identified or evaluated in the EISs. To strengthen soft site analysis criteria, 
We recommend that lots smaller than 5,000 square feet should be considered based on their potential for lot mergers. Um, Increased range and scope of alternatives evaluated in CEQA. Another fundamental improvement needed in the CEQA process is the evaluation of a wider range and scope of alternatives. Typically, CEQA documents are limited to the evaluation of no action and with action development scenario. MAS has several recommendations for strengthening alternatives uh, analysis and disclosing the full development potential of large scale rezoning. I'll, for the sake of time, I'll just enumerate them here. Um, the recommendations include uh, an alternative that would um, that would evaluate development that would be reasonably reasonable to occur uh, through zoning law mergers and the transfer of developments. Time and time again, we have seen rezonings um, completed and approved, but subsequent de development occurs through lot mergers and transfer of development rights that isn't evaluated in EISs. Um, another is a reverse land use alternative in which the d a different primary uh, zoning use that is permitted under the rezoning is evaluated. And this would address potential market and economic condition changes over the course of the build year and, and, and past the build year. Uh, we also recommend an optimal sustainable development scenario which looks at the sustainability of a project based on various number of sustainable um, mechanisms and metrics. And finally, uh, to strengthen the community input in the planning process, uh, uh, where applicable, we suggest an alternative that uh, evaluates um, the, a community-based plan, community plan um, with an existing plan and uh, 197A or otherwise. Um, Secret lead agencies should be, provide a clear and accurate explanation for the purpose and needs section of EIS as to how a particular project would balance its goals with environmental concerns. For city-sponsored projects, stated objectives and secret documents must, comp must correspond with how the project would meet the public needs and respond to applicable policies. For example, if a, if a project proposes to provide affordable housing or result in sustain, sustainable benefits, the EIS must evaluate the impacts of various income levels under the city's MIH program or quanti quantitatively disclose and assess the partic particular sustainable measures being, being proposed. Um, uh, f finally, EIS quality must be improved. In general, EISs are cumbersome, unwieldy documents that are difficult for most people to read, let alone understand. We recommend improving standards for form, content, and consistency to make EISs more clear. We also suggest a short version hi highlighting the primary findings and conclusions in plain language. The time is ripe for an overhaul of the secret process. As we stated in our reports, we recognize that no city official or planning practitioner has a crystal ball with which to f forecast future development. However, when the city initiates a large-scale neighborhood rezoning, even one with laudable goals, New Yorkers deserve a reliable representation of expected development and realistic evaluation of its impacts. Too often, they receive neither. Thank you for this opportunity to provide comments for, this, for these bills. Hi, <clears throat> good afternoon. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Elena Conti. I'm Director of Policy at the Pratt Center for Community Development. And in our extensive expertise supporting low income and communities of color in urban planning, we have encountered many of the shortcomings of the city's environmental review process. And we've witnessed the ways these technocratic exercises have supported and advanced direct harm in communities. There's nothing wonky about the documents that dress wolves in sheep's clothing and become the repeated basis for decisions that exacerbate inequality and rob communities of the physical and social investments they need to thrive. The shortcomings of the city environmental quality review process are extremely detrimental in several fundamental ways. First, they set up unreasonable expectations and provide false information to decision makers who are considering the merits, impacts, and ways to, Im to mitigate a proposed project. Second, even when a significant adverse impact is found, suggested mitigations are not required to address the impact in any meaningful way, mitigations are not required to be instituted, and there are no funding or accountability mechanisms to ensure that commitments come about or in the future to measure whether the issue has been addressed. 
Yet for all the obvious harm of these grave flaws, they become all the more maddening because of the larger failings of our current planning system. Because the seeker process is detailed and produces a long report, this creates the guise that it is accurate and thorough, or as we heard today, rigorous. Uh, and this is often used as an excuse not to provide communities with uh, the kind of planning analyses and follow-up activities that they are truly seeking. In turn, communities place major significance on the review process because it is the only official one made available to them. But the manual provides far from a complete look at what's important. For example, in its 833 pages, race is avoided almost entirely, save for its mention in the state's definition of environmental justice and a prohibition against survey bias. This hearing is a vital first step to creating the type of rigor and accountability in the environmental review process that is necessary in an honest process. And the interests that are being heard today, 1487, 1523, 1531, are important conversation starters that point to three key areas where the guidance in the technical manual is deficient. Measuring secondary residential displacement risk and impact, transportation effects, and accounting impacts on, uh, for impacts on school capacity. Intro 252 elaborates on important questions that were unaddressed when the Neighborhood Commitment Tracker was heard as Intro 1132 in June 2016. So we have done extensive exploration of the ways that the guidance of the technical manual belies logic and common sense uh, in order to erase the vulnerability of those facing significant residential displacement risk through loopholes and assumptions. Building on the work of Renee Wittison to articulate these flaws, we further examined eight environmental impact statements conducted as part of rezonings from 2005 to 2018, spanning the Bloomberg and de Blasio administrations to see how the guidance was applied. We found wildly inconsistent results with significant impact rarely being found. In the instances where it was found, Greenpoint Williamsburg and the Columbia expansion, the scale of the impacted population identified was less than 3,400 people, while in other instances, such as East New York, the number of vulnerable people was identified as more than 49,000, but dismissed as being insignificant. In still other neighborhoods, Inwood, East Harlem, Far Rockaway, the number of people at risk was never quantified at all. As a follow-up to this work, we have performed a deep dive into the methodology for assessing commercial displacement risk. Similarly, we find tremendous gaps related to the functions businesses serve in neighborhood and as employers, complete avoidance of consumer differences, and an inaccurate conception of industry clusters functions. For our forthcoming publication, 12 EISs dating back to the downtown Brooklyn rezoning, including Greenpoint Williamsburg, Gateway in the Bronx, Gateway in East New York, Willits Point, and more recent ones as Inwood, uh, like Inwood and Jerome were looked at. And what we learned here is that none of the EIS has concluded that there would be any displacement impact, direct or indirect, on businesses. In fact, we believe there has never been an EIS that has found a business displacement impact, although I await anybody um, pointing it out to me otherwise, looking around for the other experts in the room. Um, the methodology here appears to be an elaborate exercise designed to declare that there is no impact and therefore that no scrutiny should be paid to the way that land use actions affect economic activity or policy. So these two pieces of research illustrate some of the egregious ways that the seeker review paints over the impacts of rezonings. But the flaws in the methodologies in the socioeconomic conditions section of the manual are just one illustration of the larger issues across the manual. Many of the sections of the manual perform the same function, glossing over impacts so as to facilitate approval, robbing decision makers of the tools needed to properly assess projects and create public policy. At a minimum, sections that are well overdue for overhauls include school capacity, transportation, open space, climate change, public health, and the overall consideration of environmental justice. Uh, so the introduced resolution is very welcome. Uh, so Summing up, getting close. The question for today is not what is the best methodology for any given section, but rather how do we change our systems to incorporate the wisdom of the public, and how do we develop the forecasting, measuring, and accountability tools that can provide us with shared information from which we can learn and create policy. So we propose regular, public, and transparent process for updating the guidance of the seeker technical manual. Currently, the manual is updated in intermittent timeframes, subject to the whim of different administrations or interests, and dominated by the policy perspective of the administration, instead of data from the environmental review and planning processes working the other way to inform policy. 
So we propose that an update process be required every five years, and that process should include official, transparent methods of taking input from the public, including hearings, and a published summary of all the input offered and how it was considered. This process should also incorporate data that looks at neighborhood change over time in areas where EISs have been conducted in order to learn from the ways different public actions have impact. And second, we call for expanding planning processes to include goal setting, measurement, and accountability tools in the context of new development and beyond. These should be used to inform policy. One of the greatest tensions in the debate over environmental review is whether a particular impact can be tied exclusively to the proposed action. For communities, that completely misses the point. They care about what they are experiencing and seeing from a cumulative perspective. Residential displacement, for example, is rampant across the city, and we have the tools to measure risk and create policy in response. However, we fail to do so. We need a comprehensive planning approach that identifies goals and principles, squarely aiming at racial and economic disparities, seeking to overcome the unequal legacy of historic decisions, sets citywide and local targets with active participation from the public, and implements measurement and accountability measures such as budget alignment and look back provisions. We are striving for this now in the charter revision process alongside the Thriving Communities Coalition as part of their effort. And if that process does not go far enough, uh, as we fear it may not, check us out Thursday night, we'll be rallying and participating. <laughs> um, the council has and should exercise its power to legislat legislatively require a citywide residential displacement risk analysis, as well as other key measures of issues of unmet need across communities. So we look forward to sharing and discussing our research in more detail and to working with the council to strengthen the proposed intros to align with these goals, as well as to working with you to craft an overarching seeker and planning agenda. We also look forward to working with the mayor's office of environmental coordination and other relevant agencies, including the Department of City Planning, to incorporate more specific recommendations and methodology that grow out of our research and expertise. Thank you. Thank you. Just a couple of questions, and thank you uh, for the chair for uh, allowing me the opportunity to ask. Uh, do you believe including the public uh, in the revision of the seeker manual will lead to more uh, realistic assessments made by the seeker analysis? I would certainly hope so. <laughs> um, that is definitely our recommendation, and I think that even if uh, it doesn't change the methodology, it will lead to many other positive incomes, outcomes. Great. We need you for the record on that. Uh, do you know of any neighborhood rezonings in the last 10 years in neighborhoods that were not majority minority? That is an excellent question. Not to my knowledge. I mean, East Midtown. Yeah, well, East Midtown was yeah, East Midtown, but it wasn't residential. It was a commercial rezoning. So do you think it's, it's safe to say that displacement caused by rezonings disproportionately affect people of color? I would say that it is safe to say that. Uh, and I know you had run down a couple of suggestions that you would like to make changes for in the uh, seeker manual uh, to create uh, sort of the estimates on impacts uh, that we as council members and community boards and borough presidents can use to protect communities of color uh, from displacement and residential and commercial. Uh, we would love to sort of work with you a little bit more on that as well. Uh, my last question, and that's it uh, for me, is do you think that the downtown uh, Brooklyn and Long Island City rezonings um, were successful? So, I mean, I guess it's, it's I can't, I guess I would say that you cannot disqualify that, that some, it brought economic development and positive aspects. But if you measure success, as Councilmember Barron was mentioning, based on what the projections were made, I guess the methodology and the procedure to evaluate that outcome is deficient. So it's, it's more about the process, the way, from my perspective, that the, the, it was not success, successful as a procedure document to evaluate an outcome. And I will add to that, uh, 
that, yeah, so when, uh, keeping in mind that these, both of these rezonings were intended to, to be an expansion of commercial office space, they were to create uh, th third and fourth central business districts, but what happened was, was that these, these two neighborhoods became, uh, they became residential neighborhoods and, um, and not necessarily affordable uh, residential neighborhoods. Um, and, and as our report has shown that there, there are major consequences for those, um, for the miscalculations in the development that happened. So uh, I would, uh, to Marcel's latter point, I would say that no, these were not successful in terms of um, providing the communities with the infrastructure, the schools, the transit, um, and the open space that, that we have seen now that, that, are, that all of these areas are, are problematic. And, and uh, I'm gonna turn it back over to uh, the chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for being here today and um, thank you for your live Twitter feeds, uh, you know, what's happening here. Um, you were here for the hearing. We spoke about the reasonable worst case development scenario. Uh, what was your opinion on their response where they're, they do not go back and, and, and basically double check the, the work or double check their reporting, uh, the reports uh, that they gave the council uh, in which the council voted on such zoning uh, change? Um, well, I, I can't really speak on that, but I can speak on the reasonable worst case development scenario in general uh, is problematic in, in, in the secret technical manual and that we have found time and time again that there are flaws in how the reasonable worst case development scenario is uh, assessed um, and it is the framework for the entire evaluation. So anytime that there are deficiencies in it, it affects the whole evaluation. Um, I, we talked about soft site analysis. I know that there was a discussion uh, on uh, not considering uh, rent stabilized uh, units in, uh, in the no build uh, analysis. So these are all things that affect what gets evaluated in the secret technical manual, and is, is it truly the worst case development scenario, and we, we question that. Yeah. Do you, um, do you, would you agree that they should change their policy and uh, moving forward after a zoning application has been approved and development has happened, that they go back and review uh, what their recommendations were? Absolutely, I mean, we, we recommended, I mean, think, I mean, it falls into the, the category of mitigation. Um, and as far as we can tell, well, first of all, there's, there's very little input. The public doesn't have much input in what mitigation is proposed. Because as, as I mentioned, by the time the public is aware of it, it's in the final EIS and there's no chance for comment. But there's little in the way of um, public disclosure and transparency into the follow-up of mitigation. So. EISs are done, pro rezonings are approved, but the public has no way to know if, for example, if traffic mitigation that was proposed in their neighbor is actually being carried through, and more, more importantly, if it's effective. There's no, you know, what we're saying is that if, if the public is made aware, if there's more disclosure and, and, and the city goes back and looks at the mitigation uh, for the impacts, um, that we can build up a, an inventory of successful mitigation measures that can be used in other rezonings. But if, if I can just add quickly, the scientific method is based on observation, documentation, and reflection of what's happening in our environment, an urban or natural environment. And like by this legislation would just force the city to do that analysis, that retrospective analysis, to inform the models and methods that they're using for forecasting the future. Essentially, that is, it was, it was science, science was mentioned in, 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 uh, throughout the hearing, and I think this is just basic, you know, science one-on-one. -on -one. It just, you just document the existing and previous conditions. Yeah. Um, then lastly, in, in your opinion, um, what do you think about the Brooklyn and Long Island City 
uh, rezonings. You know, the environmental reviews were, do you think that they were most, they were most responsible for the floor projections? Well, I mean, I'll reiterate that, that no planning practitioner has a crystal ball and it, that the secret process is a disclosure process. And it's, it, it's probably not fair to, um, to, to hold uh, a lead agency responsible if there are major economic changes that affect the kind of development that happens, which is one of the reasons why we feel that the secret process can be improved if there's a wide range of alternatives that are evaluated so that it informs and uh, the public and gives a sense of predictability in case there are market changes or economic changes. Um, the, it is clear that the, uh, the projections in the, both of those rezonings were, were way off um, and, the, and, the, and the environmental uh, consequences were never addressed and never evaluated in those respective EISs. So, um, you know, we just, uh, I, th I think, you know, having been on the other side of the table as a consultant working on secret documents, um, I, think, I think that the secret, secret methodology needs to be re uh, revised to make it more flexible. Uh, I think it's very rigid, and, and I think that there are mechanisms within the process that can lend more predictability. But I think as it stood, I mean, in 2001 and 2004, um, the, you know, having gone back through those EISs, um, there were some assumptions uh, that were, were demonstrably way off. Uh, the Long Island City, for example, there was a, the, the projection was for 300 new dwelling units. And just in the rezoning area alone, there were almost 11,000. So it, it's just an example of how, how off those projections were and you know, gets into our recommendations for how to narrow that focus. Um, Chair Salamanca, if I may just, uh, I guess, bundle my responses to those questions all together. Um, I th for me, uh, personally, my, I am less specifically concerned with the Office of Environmental Coordination going back and doing the look back. Um, I think it could, um, I think they could have a role in it, but I am more concerned about where is the planning and the looking back and the monitoring that is supposed to be happening between the times when we're seeking approval for something that the administration wants, right? So sort of the ongoing planning processes. So I thought it actually was proper and correct that the representative from Department of City Planning attempted to talk about the planning systems that are in place um, that they look at um, uh, between rezonings, but I would, um, uh, beg to differ with sort of their self-assessment that we're aware of transportation pl problems and we're addressing them and we're aware of school seat capacity problems and we're addressing them. It's very clear that those issues are not being addressed sufficiently and that's the crisis of inequality that we have. Um, so I think that there um, uh, needs to be a look back and there needs to be a feedback loop um, about information that is gained based in reality in terms of what happened so that we don't have the same conversation prior to every single rezoning where folks say, no, 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 here's our number and they're perfect and they're fine, and we have lots of real life experience that documents it otherwise, but the process still proceeds the same. Um, so we need to build on that. We need to have look backs that integrate these things together. And then broadly to the question of success, I think it comes down to whether, um, it's a little philosophical, right? Whether we believe that the system is working exactly as it is intended to reify structural racism, or whether we can actually say that these systems should point at something else, right? That we can aspire to higher goals of racial equity and we can make adjustments in these systems to make them actually work. And to me, that was part of the tension that I heard between what the council members were expressing today and what seemed to be um, some of the response on this side of the table. Okay. Um, and then my last question is, um, the, the, the panel prior uh, mentioned that they are planning on making changes to the seeker manual. Um, and that they're open to community input. Uh, have they reached out to you at all um, ab about any type of community input? Number one and number two, this predates me. Um, when they've made changes in the past on the seeker manual, have they ever uh, uh, seeked community input uh, in, in these changes? 
Uh, to answer your first question, no, they haven't reached out. And to answer your second question, not to my knowledge. Uh, it's, a, it's used, the secret technical manual is usually updated um, by a consortium of consultants and city agencies. Okay, um, I don't have any further questions. Do you have any further questions, Chair Moya? Well, I thank you so much for staying here th through this hearing and giving us your, st <laughs> your, your statement. Thank you. Thank you All right. Uh, yes, we are. All right, so up next we have Mr. Pedro Estevez, uh, Ivan Garcia, Robert C uh, Cornwell, and uh, Paula Siegel. Yeah, and Sergeant General Arms, if we can uh, start the clock, each, um, each speaker will get two minutes. My name is Pedro Estevez. I'm the president of the United Auto Merchants Association. Just make sure that you, the microphone is turned on and that yes. you're speaking into the microphone. Thank you. My name is Pedro Estevez. I'm the president of the United Auto Merchants Association, representing over 700 automotive businesses and their employees in the greatest city of New York. And we would like to, that the resolution 009-2018 be passed into law. Why? Because what happened to 250 businesses in the Willis Point uh, sector in Queens. Also because what happened to 45 businesses and the employees allegedly moving from t to 1080 Leggett Avenue in the Bronx from Queens paid by $4.8 million that they were awarded by the court to, to their relocation. There also is what happened it was happening to these 200 plus businesses in the Jerome Avenue corridor that they employees. They have 85%, none of them have any more leases because the speculators and the landlords. And by, by the way, 75% of those businesses live in the same community that they are working. They all have something in common. They are all being displaced from their neighborhoods. They are a mixture of Latinos and minorities and people of color, along with the employees that they live in those neighborhoods for generations and they're gonna have no place where to go. Why is this happening to our small auto-related businesses and others um, small businesses in our communities with their employees? Why are the developers taking, being allowed to take advantage of the situation by planning long ahead to spend so much money to build, what to build, to change our landscapes, but now one, they're not uh, spending hardly nothing or anything in planning to prepare those for the transition that's gonna take place and those that are living there for generations and generations. They all have something in common. They are victims of the generation, uh, there's gentrification and the peril, according to the landlords, is, is not the, the problem. No respect is given to them. But those implementing those by their own will, when other representatives are going to put a stop in the abuse of the developers and think of those that are going to suffer which before they approve the implementation of rezonings in our neighborhoods. When are they given the, and Mr. realized? Mr. Estevez, I'm gonna ask you to wrap up, please. These are the questions that all these over 700 businesses and employees are asking to the committee over here, the land use committee, as well as the uh, elected officials. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Robert Cornwell. I'm a senior housing attorney with Make the Road New York, a nonprofit organization based in Bushwick, Brooklyn, Jackson Heights, Queens, Port Richmond, Staten Island, Long Island, and Westchester. Make the Road supports intro 1487 to study the secondary displacement that has occurred from neighborhood rezoning since 2015. We believe the study is a needed tool to enable the city to capture the real world effects that rezonings have had on neighborhoods already facing displacement due to market forces. We believe this data will also be useful in future rezoning processes so that communities in the city will have quantifiable data to analyze and mitigate the likely effects that will occur in these neighborhoods. 
Um, prior to this bill, applications for neighborhood rezonings repeatedly brushed aside or failed to analyze indirect displacement in a meaningful way. Uh, the, the seeker manual is notably flawed in that it requires rezoning under study to introduce or accelerate existing trends of displacement for there to be a finding of significant socioeconomic change. Moreover, the seeker manual fails to include analysis of secondary displacement of rent regulated units, incorrectly assuming that rent regulation laws effectively prevent any threat of displacement to rent regulated tenants. In prior rezoning applications, the city relied on the seeker manual's flawed methodology to bootstrap a conclusory argument that rezonings are not harmful to communities because those communities are already experiencing gentrification and displacement. Moreover, the city did not study the risk of in indirect displacement of rent stabilized units due to the untenable reasoning that rent regulation protects against the risk of such displacement. Notwithstanding the merits of the proposed law, we do believe the bill should be strengthened specifically to include a focus on measuring the acceleration of displacement and the loss of rent regulated units in contrast to what is laid on the seeker manual. As I have mentioned, as many of us know, this is contrary to the reality on the ground. In addition, it is important to hear from the communities who have been impacted by these rezonings. In, a, in conclusion, at a time when such at a time when much of our conversation is about producing new affordable housing, it is important to recognize the loss of existing affordable housing that occurs from rezoning and, and how we can better study that. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for holding this hearing. My name is Paula Siegel. I'm senior staff attorney in the Equitable Neighborhoods Practice at the Community Development Project at the Urban Justice Center. I believe you have my testimony there. I'm just gonna invite you to flip it over. Footnote nine gives you a snapshot of the world we know we live in. Tenants, long-time tenants, low-income residents are subject to harassment and displacement in our neighborhoods. That harassment spikes when city actions make land use land values go up this is a reality that the the folks who are following the technical manual and writing environmental impact statements have been given permission by this administration to ignore they're not only ignoring the reality they're also ignoring state law State law requires that environmental impacts, including secondary displacement, be studied and be presented to a lead agency before that agency makes a decision to do an action that could cause those impacts. What the technical manual as drafted now allows lead agencies to do is just hide them. They say, nobody who lives in a unit that's in any kind of program is going to be impacted, even though we have a whole industry of buyout experts in this city. We need to get the administration in line with state law. I'm not reading from my testimony. I invite you to do that. We, re we support that move. I do not think that a resolution is enough. Um, we need to push the environmental review process into a much more public arena we need to legislate a process that will have public review and that will bring the city into line with state law and keep us from having to go to the courts every single time that impacts are improperly ignored. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ivan Garcia, and I am the Neighborhood Rezoning Coordinator at Make the Road New York. I am here today to speak in favor of Intro 1487. Currently, I oversee Make the Roads Housing and Land Use Portfolio and spend much of my time coordinating the Housing Dignity Coalition, a Staten Island faith and community-based coalition that is responding to yet another bad rezoning targeting the North Shore of Staten Island. For the past two years in my role, our coalition has engaged hundreds of community leaders envisioning circles to articulate what a responsible North Shore rezoning would look like. In that time, we have also trained dozens of local leaders to become mini planning experts alongside technical partners like the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development. There is much wrong with the way that our city treats neighborhood uh, place planning. For a start, the key word neighborhoods are always left out of the process. But for the sake of this hearing, I will limit my comments to the underground experiences of our members and what seeker gets wrong about their experiences. 
The housing stock of the North Shore is made up of smaller homes that today are not protected under the Emergency Tenant Protection Act. 85% of the housing stock is unregulated, and renters who make up a significant stock of the market are vulnerable to displacement at any moment, as they have no access to guaranteed lease renewals and can have their rent increased by any amount at any time after the current lease expires. Given the tens of thousands of renters in the district and the lack of protections, we know the impact that a rezoning will have when the market heats. However, the impact is underestimated per the displacement analysis of the Department of City Planning. According to the EIS, only 1,700, uh, 1,782 renters were identified as being potentially vulnerable to displacement. I can tell you by firsthand account that speculation of the market has already resulted in several members of my coalition, including one church, being displaced by this rezoning. The problems are many. For one, SICA currently only considers low-income tenants who are in unregulated units as at risk of displacement. The city must understand that every low-income tenant in a study area of a rezoning is at risk of displacement. It does not matter if they live in a rent-stabilized apartment oh, or have a housing voucher. Um, our tenants, even those with some level of protection, are facing landlord neglect and harassment so they can self-evict. These tactics that landlords use to get tenants out are used more frequently when landlords believe that the market can bear higher rents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your statements. Do you have any questions? Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to call up the next panel. We have, uh, and I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, but uh, you know what? La, La Morte? Kate La Morte? Uh, Luis Carrero? Emily Goldstein? And Alyssa Chan? Um, good afternoon, uh, Chair Salamanca and Moya. My name is Luis Enriquez Carrero. I work with uh, Legal Services New York City. Um, I believe you will have copies of my testimony. I ask that you take the time to examine it carefully. I'm just going to use my time to highlight a couple of, of things. I direct the Tenant Rights Coalition, which is Legal Services NYC program devoted to providing tenant advocacy services in the rezone specifically. So I direct the Tenant Rights Coalition for Brooklyn which were concentrated in East New York, Brownsville, and surrounding neighborhoods. In early 2016, we were testifying, uh, as of the time of the proposed mandatory inclusionary housing program and the East New York rezoning, alongside scores of tenant and community-based organizations, raising the red flags about what we expected could happen with this rezoning in terms of the speeding up of gentrification. Based on the work that we have been doing in East New York and Brownsville in the past three years, uh, I am unhappy to confirm that a lot of those red flags, uh, we have seen them in our own casework, right? In East New York and Brownsville, we have seen the uh, increase in the amount of eviction proceedings in unregulated housing, which is now being purchased and owned by LLCs. It's no longer an individual person who owns a two or three family home. It's limited liability corporations, right? We have seen it in uh, landlords in East New York and Brownsville increasingly bringing more complex eviction proceedings, the type of proceedings that you usually see in Manhattan housing court, non-primary residents, owners use, chronic rent delinquency eviction proceedings. These landlords are now bringing them in neighborhoods like East New York and Brownsville. We have seen it with one of the largest uh, landlords in Brownsville, Nelson Management Group, wanting to install a face recognition uh, keyless entry system at Atlantic uh, Pacific Towers, uh, which has garnered incredible opposition by the residents of that project, and we're working with those folks there uh, to oppose that application, but they all know that Nelson Management is doing it to make Atlantic Plaza Towers more attractive for more affluent newcomers. And so I have more examples in my written testimony about what we have seen in our casework about the speeding up of gentrification in the rezones. Uh, we believe that the proposed legislation makes a lot of sense. One comment I'll say about the five-year HPD study proposed by, uh, by your um, um, legislation. Um, we believe actually that five years may be five years too late. Um, the impact of sp the speeding up of gentrification in the reasons we see it every day, we would suggest as an organization uh, a study that begins in the year 2019 and 
continues every year uh, thereafter. We, be, we do not believe that there is uh, uh, the concept of too much studying um, exists. Thank you. So while I appreciate that, uh, the reason why we do it is that's the definition that they use in the seeker manual for five years, and we need to look at what has gone on in the uh, uh, major neighborhood rezonings uh, that have happened since uh, 2015. That's the reason why we need to have that analysis and we look at what is being used as their definition uh, to seek further uh, studies as we go forward. Um, be it through another process of legislation or some other process that can, this body can encourage, I would just uh, throw out there that what we have seen in our neighborhoods and kind of like studying it and taking corrective measures is something that we should really be considering on a yearly basis because that is the speed at which things are happening in the places where we do our work. In, in 10 seconds, can you just repeat what you mentioned about the face recognition? You mentioned Nelson Management. Nelson Management Group filed an application with the DHCR. Uh, Atlantic Pacific Towers is 700 units and he wants to install a face recognition keyless entry system uh, into his, uh, just for tenants to be able to come in and out. Tenants, predominantly black and Latino, predominantly female tenants know that Nelson Management Group is doing this to track their every movement and to set the stage for eviction proceedings and at the same time to create a more high tech and secure living environment that will attract the new folks that Nelson Management Group knows are moving into places like East New York and, and Brownsville. New newcomers, white, young and people. And the, 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 uh, the, the state agency approved this? It's in the process. We are representing over 100 tenants in that, pro in that proceeding before the DHCR, opposing the landlord's application to install this face recognition software. And he was trying to do this with a, as an MCI? Uh, he's actually not trying to do it as an MCI, he's doing it as an application for modification of services, which further tells us what the real intentions behind this are. Not even seeking to profit, in, you know, a la the traditional MCI, really kind of like hoping to do this in a way that would not get noticed and that would not garner so much opposition, but it has really backfired because it has garnered tremendous movement from the tenants at Atlantic Pacific Towers. Okay, thank you, thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Emily Goldstein. I'm the Director of Organizing and Advocacy at the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development, or ANHD. I have longer written testimony that you have before you. I'll just sort of summarize in my two minutes. Frankly, in every rezoning hearing for years now in neighborhoods across the city, as has been pointed out, primarily low-income communities of color, community residents have testified ad nauseum regarding their own experiences of harassment, rising rents, displacement pressure, and speculation on the homes where they have often lived for decades, only to be told that their concerns are out of scope or contradicted by official DCP projections because the methodology used to evaluate residential displacement risk is extraordinary extraordinarily outdated and inaccurate. Most notably, the seeker methodology incorrectly assumes that many populations, including rent-stabilized tenants, face no risk of displacement. We know this to be untrue. To continue using a methodology that ignores so many residents that is so clearly out of touch with reality of most New Yorkers' experiences, discredits the entire land use process for many, and prevents the acknowledgement, let alone mitigation, of the actual negative impacts many land use actions have on existing residents. I think uh, there's a phrase, if we, if we ignore history, we're doomed to repeat it. And frankly, this administration and previous administrations have insisted on continuing to ignore history and have therefore been repeating it. But the doom doesn't fall on administrative representatives. The doom falls on low-income communities of color and on the residents who are consistently pushed out of their homes. Uh, beyond that, even when uh, in the rare situation when a negative impact is found, there's no actual requirement that a mitigation plan be enacted or that a land use plan be changed to prevent or reduce the harm. Most recently, in the past few years, MIH often gets cited as a mitigation for displacement, ignoring the gap between those affordability levels and the actual needs of local residents. I'll sum up. Um, and also ignoring the difference between keeping a resident in their home and providing a new home for another resident. 
Uh, my written testimony has recommendations we believe would help to strengthen some of the specific legislation that's being proposed, but overall we appreciate and support the council's efforts to take further oversight and fill in some of the gaps in the system that we have. Thank you. I just want to recognize the work that you do. Um, I've met with your executive director, and my office does use your database, uh, which helps us whenever there are tenant complaints on buildings in my district where we have slumlords or, uh, you know, or, or, or we're just trying to navigate to figure out who owns the building. So thank you. I'm glad we're able to be helpful. Hi, my name is Alyssa Chan, and I'm here to testify on behalf of the Legal Aid Society. Thank you to Chair Salamanca, Chair Moya, and the committee for having this very important hearing. Um, Legal Aid's housing attorneys fight for the rights of tenants across all five boroughs every single day, and we take on thousands of cases in housing court each year. Um, and through that work, we know intimately the pressures that tenants are facing in the current housing market. Um, we also know that despite their stated goal of increasing affordable housing, the neighborhood rezonings that we've seen are actually accelerating development and speculation in low-income communities of color, um, and thereby, thereby forcing out long-term tenants. We're already seeing this being experienced by our clients. But currently, as we've heard today, there is no requirement that the city study the effects of these rezonings on indirect, secondary, on indirect residential displacement after a rezoning, meaning that as we consider future rezonings, both communities and policymakers have no quantitative information to use to guide them. We think that's wrong, and we support Intro 1487, which would re require the collection and reporting of that data. Um, we have two main um, recommendations to strengthen um, some of the data that's collected, uh, mainly that we think the secret technical manual has uh, two significant, well, many significant flaws, two that I'll mention today. Um, first, the analysis, as we've heard, considers only low-income tenants in unregulated units to be vulnerable to displacement. Um, we know that that's not true at Legal Aid. We see tenants be displaced from rent-regulated units all the time, um, so we urge uh, that the bill make sure to incorporate these rent regulated tenants in its analysis. We also think um, the fact that the seeker manual does not require that analysts consider uh, demographic information like race and ethnicity, gender, age, education, or language in its analysis is a big oversight and also ignores the fact that we know, which is that displacement often follows longstanding trends of racial discrimination and segregation. Um, so we would urge that the bill also make sure to incorporate um, those demographics in its study. Thank you. I have a quick question for uh, both the legal aid and legal services. Um, in the last three years, I know that there's been a few rezonings that have been approved by the council, um, East New York, Jerome, um, and there's other ones. Have you, has your agency, have you seen uh, your agency representing any of the tenants that live in those communities which were rezoned uh, and you represent them in court because they're trying to get evicted or they're being evicted from their apartments? I would need to get to get you specific cases. I can get back to you with those. I don't um, represent tenants in those areas, so I want to get you the most accurate information, but I can let you know. I'll check in with our... Yeah, we establish um, rezoned neighborhood specific practices across East Harlem, East Harlem, Inwood, um, South Bronx, East New York, Brownsville, et cetera, starting four years ago. And, you know, we've been like ramping up hiring, et cetera, so our work has increased just by virtue of ramping up. But I can tell you anecdotally, and I can probably pull up numbers for you if you're interested, um, in terms of the increased casework that we have seen, for instance, like I said, on regulated housing brought by limited liability corporations, which is a really new thing in a neighborhood like East New York and Brownsville, which is traditionally a two, three family home is owned by a person. And now it's owned by LLCs who are bringing these folks to court. I want to thank you all. Oh, you have a question? Just one really quick question. So uh, why do you think the city yes. should include uh, rent regulated uh, apartments um, in the seeker? Uh, analysis when it uh, uh, talks about secondary displacement. If you can just. Sure. I mean, I think we can all probably speak to this. Um, I can start. Uh, I think that, you know, I can speak from our experience that we see tenants. Wait, just let me interrupt. Is there anyone from the city still here? It's a shame that uh, they would not leave anyone here, um, given that the public waited as long as they did to be here. Uh, it shows uh, exactly where the mentality of this uh, 
agency, where these agencies are, this administration. Uh, I think that this is an embarrassment for them and a demonstration of their lack of commitment uh, to what is being said here today. Uh, it's shameful uh, that uh, they would not have a representative uh, stay and listen to everyone's testimony here today. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but you're, gonna, you, you, you're giving valuable testimony here, uh, and there's no one from uh, the administration uh, to actually take that down. Um, so there are many reasons why it's important in our, from our perspective to include rent-regulated tenants in these types of analyses, but I think um, to just note that um, preferential rents are a big reason, one of the biggest that we see, about 30% of tenants in regulated apartments have preferential rents, which means that their legal registered rent is higher than what they're actually being charged by their landlord, um, which leaves them vulnerable to giant rent, rent increases. And we see the average gap between um, what they're actually paying and the legal registered rent is is in Manhattan, I believe it's like 800. It's, it's several hundred dollars across all five boroughs, and most of our clients can't afford that kind of an increase. So that leaves them vulnerable to the same exact pressures um, as unregulated tenants are vulnerable to. We also see you know, harassment by landlords, really aggressive buyout offers, all sorts of illegal tactics that landlords use to push out rent regulated tenants. Um, so we think it's really important that they be considered as part of the at-risk population when doing these types of analyses. Yeah, I would second all that and just add that if the point is to do an analysis of what the likely impacts are, and frankly, having sat through uh, the testimony of, of DCP, you know, I, I'm not asking for perfect, I recognize that we can't perfectly predict the future. If you come back and say, Superstorm Sandy happened, we didn't predict that, like that is understandable, but that's no excuse not to improve. And so in terms of why to include rent-stabilized tenants as potentially at risk, I think if the purpose of the analysis to, is to identify potential impacts, we have plenty of information, both quantitative and qualitative, to tell us that rent-stabilized tenants are displaced every day. And so that, I mean, it's just, it's just acknowledging reality, and they're displaced both through le legal and illegal means, it shouldn't be happening, but it is happening. And so that's the reality we live in, and that's the reality that policymakers like yourselves should be able to analyze and consider when you're understanding the impacts of actions you're voting on. Um, second all of that, when neighborhoods become more desirable, for instance, because of rezonings, rent-regulated landlords particularly double down on their tactics become more cunning, become more aggressive, right? For instance, Atlantic Pacific Towers uh, owner using hyper surveillance with this face recognition stuff as harassment, right? And so, uh, to Council Member Moya's point, um, a study that does not contemplate the effect of a particular program on rent regulated housing specifically, uh, to put it very lightly, is an incomplete study. And I'm sorry, just to add one more thing. So I actually work in our homeless rights pro project, and I just want to mention, it's in the testimony that I submitted as well, but if you look at shelter records, um, at the New York City shelter system, 43% of, of, of families entering shelters are coming from rent-regulated units, and about a third of those are coming because of an eviction directly. So, I mean, we have more than enough data supporting the fact that rent-regulated tenants are being forced out of their apartments and are entering our shelter system. So I think that's a great point, by the way. There is, you know, there is for highlighting that no uh, one that we missed here. But thank you for for bringing that up. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much thank for you. your testimony. Up next, we have Ms. Carmen Vega Rivera, uh, Reverend Allen Hand Sr., Alex Fanau, and Derek Blue. Good afternoon, my name is Carmen Vega Rivera and I'm a resident of the South Bronx. I'm also a CASA leader with Community Actions for Safe Apartment. For us, it's important to be part of the Thriving Communities Coalition because we witnessed firsthand through the Jerome Avenue rezoning the lack of transparency, accountability, and thoughtfulness the city has had with the planning for and investing in communities like the South Bronx. From the very beginning, the city underestimated displacement 
uh, the displacement impact for Jerome. The environmental impact studies the city released projected that only 18 residents will be directly displaced in a 92 block rezoning. We know that previous rezonings have displaced black and brown residents. After the Williamsburg rezoning, the Latino population decreased from 59 in 2000 to 34 in 2014, while the white population increased from 37 to 54. In um, Harlem on 125th Street, the rezoning, the black population decreased from 73 in 2000 to 56 in 2010, while the white population increased from 4 to 16%. The Bronx has the largest rent-stabilized housing stocks, which automatically excludes these tenants from being at risk of displacement, although we know we are often the most vulnerable. The floored secret manual allows the city to fail to acknowledge and therefore address the impact of its land use action. New York City is one of the most segregated and unequal cities in this country, and instead, intentionally planning for working class communities like mine, the, hit, the city has just exacerbated this with its actions. Neighborhoods like mine and Jerome, like Harlem, like Williamsburg, needed investment for decades and shouldn't come in exchange for new developments with, that will eventually displace current residents. After the rezoning, the majority of the housing that will be built is not affordable to the majority of the residents, many who already pay 50 more percent of their rent. We're, we were promised two schools in an already overcrowded school district, and we don't organize. We'll see these changes, one as, as they did in Williamsburg and in Harlem. And I'm just going to wrap up. I am the face of a tenant, one of those insignificant others who is disabled, senior, and of Puerto Rican descent, who's actually being displaced. So the secret manual has failed to protect me. DHCR has failed to protect me. All the rent laws have failed to protect me. And unless we have a moratorium on rezonings immediately, we're going to be fa f displacing many more folks that look just like me, sound like me, and whose last name is spelled like mine. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Alex Fennell. I'm the network director of Churches United for Fair Housing and a member of the Thriving Communities Coalition. Our organization began organizing churches after the 2005 Williamsburg waterfront rezoning devastated the Latino population of Williamsburg, largely due to the failures of the Seeker Technical Manual. The EIS predicted that 2,510 residents uh, would be displaced, but to date, 13,591 Latino residents alone have been forced out of Williamsburg. This is an unacceptable margin of error. Currently, the analysis for secondary displacement does not include rent-regulated tenants. But in rezonings, these are the residents we see most often targeted for harassment and eviction. We applaud the council for proposing a look back to address the displacement, effects of rezoning, in order to move forward. As community advocates, we think it's vital to move control of the technical manual away from the mayor's office and to create real and regular public engagement by convening a Seeker Revision Commission every five years. The rezonings experienced in our communities have overwhelmingly affected residents of color, and the technical manual re remains silent on issues of race. For this reason, the city must also move to include a racial impact study in the environmental impact statement. The racial displacement we see is, um, is ex Sorry, the displacement that we see is exclusively along racial lines. And it's not just gentrification, it's segregation. New York is one of the country's most progressive cities, yet the fifth most segregated. If we hope to live up to our progressive ideals, we need a land use process that addresses the reality of segregation. Colorblind policies that pretend this is not a race issue have gotten us where we are today, and it's well past time to not just stop this trend, but to reverse it. Thank you. Thank you for your statement. Yes, my name is uh, Dedrick Blue. I'm here representing the Harlem Interfaith Commission for Housing Equality, in addition to the 250 Seventh-day Adventist churches that are located in the city of New York. I rise in support of the resolution introduced by, by Councilperson Barron, but in addition to that, the other legislation that was proposed here today. You see, I was aghast like you were aghast. 
And this is the moment, this is the time, and this is the now for city council to step up and take charge of this process. Uh, first of all, in environmental review, we have forgotten something very important. Environmental review is not about traffic patterns. It is not about buildings. It is about people. The people are the environment. The people are in the environment. So while we look at traffic patterns, sanitations, we must also assess family stability, preservation of small businesses, workforce development, and community agencies such as churches that maintain the stability of our communities. Secondly, there's a methodological f a flaw in their, in, the, in their work. While they're busy assessing project to project and neighborhood to neighborhood, in the city we're playing a shell game. The shell game is that we're moving poor people from one neighborhood to the next neighborhood. So what happens uptown impacts downtown. What happens downtown impacts the South Bronx. What happens in Brooklyn impacts Queens. And all the time, we're looking only at the minutia and not pulling back and seeing the total picture. Until we see the total picture, the methodology has failed. Secondly, I was also aghast when they talk about worst case scenario and then backing that down to a conservative analysis. Why are we backing it down to a conservative? The conservative analysis has failed. The methodology has failed. MI fails, right? With 80-20 development, it has failed. And so finally, I would just say this. Assessing the impact is not the same as addressing the impact. Until the city council takes control of the process, then we will be left to the vicissitudes. We as the people are counting on you. We are depending on you. And we will do, from the, uh, from the standpoint of congregations, we will stand with you, we will rally the troops, we will do what we have to do to get you the votes when it gets to the floor. Thank you, thank you for your testimony. Um, we're gonna bring up the next panel. We have Ms. Uh, Basha Gerhardt, Reverend Clyde, uh, Bishop James Clark, Claver T uh, Tucker, and Reverend Robert Jones, Jr. And then lastly, is there Reverend Allen Han Sr.? All right, you may begin. To the chair, good afternoon. My name is Reverend Robert Jones Jr. I'm the pastor of the Second St. John Baptist Church and we are located in the village of Harlem. And I'm also representing the Baptist Ministers Conference of Greater New York and Vicinity. Uh, it's about 200 churches um, from the Bronx and Brooklyn and Manhattan. And we are concerned with uh, the situation that is happening in our neighborhoods with the contractors and developers. Uh, it's affecting uh, our membership because when they come in and, and, and remodel and rebuild, uh, the rent goes up and it's like two or three thousand dollars and our residents that's there now if they if it's rezoned out or they have to move they'll never be able to come back to pay those type of prices uh, the rezoning law was created to benefit the residents and businesses not rent to soar leading to mass displacement rezoning should provide long-term and permanent protection for residents and businesses including the provision of permanent affordable houses and commercial spaces. The members are requested to convert, we are com, uh, we're requesting to convert RES 0009-2018 into a law uh, because that's the only way to ensure residents and business are protected by the laws of New York City. The workforce earned between 20 and and 90,000 per year. The median rent is around $3,000 a month. Sowing rates are causing mass displacement of families, destabilizing neighborhoods, and causing community-based institutions to disappear. The only beneficiaries are developers. District Council, all right. 
I'll stop there. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Father Clyde Coomerly, and as chair of the Housing Commission of the MICA Institute, I represent uh, more than 200 multi-faith leaders from the five boroughs of New York. We seek passage of Resolution 0009. In fact, we urge that it make its way to the full city council as an intro, a law with enforcement, at, with enforcement teeth. Uh, gentrification and untrammeled development are rapidly changing the fabric of our city. It is being eaten away by displacement of the people and the small businesses from our neighborhoods whose vitality and variety have been the envy of the world. The beautiful mosaic of which we have been so proud and which makes New York a worldwide tourist destination, bringing huge tourist dollars, is disappearing before our eyes. Worse yet, everyday workers who make New York function are being displaced at unprecedented rates. Our firefighters, our teachers, our sanitation workers, our police, our caregivers, our service workers cannot afford the rents which are being charged as development continues to displace our people. The people who make up the congregations in our houses of worship. This is not what our faiths teach us is the Creator's way. We believe, we believe as people of faith that we have been placed on this earth to flourish and that the Creator has provided resources so that all may share in the bounty which is so freely given. It is the sinful nature of human greed that results in low wages, unchecked development, and 63,000 people living homeless in the richest city on earth. You, our lawmakers, have not created this mess, but now you are in a position to take action, to make change. Now is the, dis the time. Displacement must end. And radical orient reorientation of seeker is the key. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this afternoon. I'm Bishop James R. Clark, Jr. I'm the presiding bishop of the churches of our Lord Jesus Christ with 550 uh, churches domestically and foreign with a good representation here in the, uh, the city of New York. I'm here this afternoon to join my colleagues in appealing to the Land Use Committee to convert Resolution 9 into law. This is the only way that we will be able to set limits on the radical displacement of residents and small business owners from locations they have lived and worked in for decades. We are not against all development. We simply want to ensure that the unjust and radical displacement of these community members be curtailed. We need a law to do that. This resolution will not accomplish that in. Current rezoning practices cause rents to soar. Uh, apartments are unaffordable to the workforce of the uh, communities who are predominantly people of color, whose wages range between $20,000 and $90,000 uh, dollars a year, which falls far short of the $120,000 that is being demanded under current conditions. In order to change these injustices, Resolution 9 needs to be converted to a law with teeth that will correct the injustices that are being impact, uh, imposed upon members of our congregations and our neighbors in the community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am Club Boy Tucker, a member of the Interfaith Committee a Seventh-day Adventist pastor representing a large number of faith believers in this community. 
as a recent member of the great family of New York and also a member of the immigrant family, I was excited today to be a part of this great process, to be able to hear the concerns not only of my members addressed, but of my own family members addressed. But I was moved to great frustration and hurt this afternoon by the blatant arrogance and disregard by the council here and those who represent uh, the issues that are affecting our community. I want to say that I rise in strong support of the resolution to be made into a law for the issues that are affecting our community are not going anywhere and that those of us who have been given the responsibility to represent, speak on behalf of, and defend the rights of those who cannot speak for themselves, the rights of those who do not have the privilege of sitting where I'm sitting this afternoon must be protected, must be considered to be sacred, must be considered even to be holy. And I ask us to think carefully on these things as we consider this issue uh, that is before us today. And I support it 100% because it is a matter of urgency. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, is there any uh, member in the public who uh, has not spoken or I did not call on? They didn't sign up? Oh. With that, um, seeing none, uh, today's business is concluded. I would like to thank members of the public, my colleagues, council and line staff for attending today's hearing. This meeting is hereby adjourned.